The best way to avoid violence, real physical violence in the form of war, in the form of crime, in the form of pick offense, the best way to avoid violence is to take care of your own backyard. Because really when violence breaks out, that is really evidence of a lot of things, but one thing is evidence of is that somebody failed in taking care of their own backyard. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into a whole diatribe about yard care because I'm not li talking literally about a yard. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 but, but, I, but, but, but like in terms of like the classical like Vonowitz literature about Vonowitz, or excuse me, or about our Vanuans and Vonowitz mini cultures, everyone takes care of their own backyard and does seriously, there is no government, there is no state, there's no need for one. Also, everyone recognizes how evil it is anyway. And that would be the end of that. We'd have other ways of resolving disputes or whatever else, and that would be the end of the state, finally. It's not the only threat to human liberty, but it's definitely the most dangerous one in our lifetimes and for the foreseeable future. So again, if everyone took care of their own backyard, the state would have already been abolished by now. And the best yep. way to avoid violence is take care of your own backyard. Yep, or I, I guess the the way um, my posthumous mentor um, Bill Cooper put it back in 1990, I don't know five or six when I was a mere three or four years old, um, he put it um, basically in the sense you know looking in the mirror. Um, if you want to know what's and he used constitutional terms. If you want to know the pro, if you want to know what's wrong with America, look in the mirror. Um, and that's like uh, that's that's always been the most uh, the most attractive thing to me. Like uh, uh, it's yeah, it's it's. Problem lies with you know the problem lies with the individual, um, lies with um, and we're talking you know you know government and state existing yeah people internalize that responsibility um, for their day to day lives in all aspects um, then yeah the state would not be necessary um, so at the end of the day yeah it's it's you know harking back to Bill Cooper you know look looking in the fucking mirror and and, and what um, you know what are you doing because you are. You're one of many, um, you know, one of many humans in this world. And if everyone, you know, looked as, and, and, and that, yeah, if everyone looked, looked at it that intensively or even had the opportunity to, um, which I think 2020 actually did for, for quite a few folks when they got out to nature and things, um, when they didn't have to go to, you know, go to their survival society jobs, um, it made them rethink a lot. Um, I think it did for you and it's, it, did, it did for me at that time too. All right, and welcome to the Vonu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, uh, Shane Rayo, too, coming to you from the Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about this burgeoning parallel network, uh, please visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A, uh, dot com. Today, my co host, uh, Kyle Reardon, joins me again for an overarching update uh, on this ongoing crypto war. Uh, Long-time listeners will remember our discussion on discussions on Phil Zimmerman and uh, the battle for email encryption in the 90s. Uh, Smuggler joined me in, I think, 2018 to discuss his long article, The Fog of Crypto War. Uh, and I believe uh, Kyle and I covered eGold, uh, surely innovative, but a project that helped to bring uh, to light some critical needs when it comes to freedom and privacy technology. Uh, that is, at least in regards to Bitcoin, uh, pri I guess uh, privacy baked in at the base layer, uh, and that services like Samurai's Whirlpool, uh, Fiat to Bitcoin, uh, XMR, or Bitcoin, XMR to Fiat, um, exchanges, etc., must be decentralized and uh, hyper resilient uh, to the ever growing uh, to this ever growing worldwide digital techno techno dystopia. Uh, the plan then is to cover background on Bitcoin privacy space for uh, necessary context, especially for Kyle here, um, and I guess there's probably quite a few listeners out there that could benefit from it too. Um, I'll mention and just talk about the Death Athletic documentary uh, momentarily because they did, uh, Samurai did, they, you know, step up and um, they were the executive producers for that, gave uh, Jessica Solsay some money to finish it. Um, and it definitely ties into, to, you know, the, the crypto, the ongoing crypto war. Um, I'll give uh, an overview of the entire Samurai situation, probably mostly. Um, I'll probably keep it less to mine and just read a really good update from Seth for Privacy uh, from Freedom.Tech. Um, he's, um, you know, suffice everything very, very well. And uh, then some background on me and Kyle's efforts in the realm of judicial transparency. And um, actually, you know, like, uh, we're going to end on some good stuff. Like, we're going to end on some good updates in regards to judicial transparency. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, hearkening back to... Uh, Harkening back to folks like Aaron Schwartz, um, you know, I, it, I'm, I'm happy to say it, it was not all for naught, even though he should most certainly be here with us today. Um, 
But uh, yeah, anyway, all that said, Kyle, welcome back, my friend. Uh, how's it going? Uh, my life has been wild and chaotic pretty much this entire year so far, but I'm hanging in there. Um, I've been following my sister's advice and not self-isolating and getting around and socializing quite a bit. So that seems to help here and there. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I'm doing okay. All right on, man. It's good to hear. It's good to hear. Um, for sure. So I guess uh, anything um, before we get into, um, I guess, the, the bulk of, uh, I guess, our discussion today, anything you want to talk about first? I want to just mention briefly that, as, as this may or may not be a shock to some people, uh, I've been going to a church lately that is it's a church that's not a church. The way they describe themselves is that we are a fellowship that has no hierarchy in terms of like a clergy, uh, the church. Uh, I guess you could say, for lack of a better term, the parishioners essentially take turns being the pastor and the minister for, like, that particular Sunday or whatever. And a lot of the sermons and, and other material, where they get together sing songs and all that, is they're more concerned about mutual aid. That comes up a lot, actually. Mutual aid comes up a lot. Uh, there's the issue about mental health comes up a lot. There's also the issue of... Uh, making sure that whatever community, family, friends, that you have good relationships with each other locally and all that. So that's all like really positive stuff that you don't really get from a formal, organized, religious, uh, major institution of really of really any flavor. Uh, there's no real readings of the Bible, really, or, or the Torah, or the Quran, or any other, you know, uh, you know centuries-old cryptic fiction novel. Uh, there's nothing really too much about that. It's more about, like, how do you get along with your fellow man? How do you take care of each other? Um, there's a certain... Uh, the only negative part about it, if you're going to say anything negative about it at all, and this is a maybe, they do tend to be leftist in the sense of not necessarily running to the state for everything. Some of them do, though, because they do so good. There's a good chunk of them that are very much pushing reformism and voting and all that. But the better part of what they do they call it social justice, but they don't mean in the same way as the SJWs do, where, like, you're shaming people and all that. They're, when they talk social, social justice, what they're really talking about really is some version of mutualism, really. Uh, it's more, uh, you know, it's the, act, the way they phrase it is acts of service based on our faith. The clothing, you know, uh, you know feed the hungry, uh, you know, clothe the naked. Um, it's, it, you know... Uh, you know, in Catholicism, it's referred to as the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Uh, by your actions, you are proving your faith kind of thing. So this, so this particular fellowship of non-church people, technically church people, where it's a very egalitarian uh, way of doing church, I'm giving it a try. Um, you know, it's also putting me in touch with other folks that might be helpful for potential future business opportunities. So there's that angle of it as well, but that was not my original intention. My original intention was I'm trying to open my mind up about some things and some weird shit that I've been doing at work or I've been seeing at work over the past couple of years that I can't fully explain. And I'm just kind of, and you know, if it doesn't come to anything, it doesn't come to anything and I'm still an agnostic. Right. Yeah. Um, but, Oh, you'll get a kick out of this shit. Today there was a post like non church or whatever, where they said new member orientation. And two of the new guys are like former ministers from like two other Protestant denominations of whatever and whatever I honestly don't remember. And so it's funny because I was talking with some of the other people like, how many former ministers of other like Protestant denominations do you guys have? And there's like what, fucking like four or five of them or something? So it's funny. Isn't that interesting? This is actually really important that you have from the hierarchical, you know, garden, you know, uh, <laughs> garden variety Christianity or cafeteria Christianity, uh, whatever the hell people that were part of formal organized religious stuff that guys like Henry Thoreau criticized back in the day. And now they are leaving that, or at least some of them have left that, and are kind of hooking up with, I guess you could say a kind of quasi-hippie, semi-leftist, egalitarian, non-church fellowship thing, where, yes, you could get, do get together on Sundays and, and sing songs and do sermons, but everybody takes turns doing it. So I guess you could say it's our kind of uh, a pseudo anarcho syndicalist commune kind of thing, <laughs> but people go together and have church. But we run it almost like a like a like a uh, like the syndicalists do. And and to be honest, it's more like mutualism. It's closer to that, like proud hoon and all that. And you, you may be shocked. Most of them are boomers. Hmm. 
So I guess these are some people, and there's some Gen X folks, so it's a little bit of an older crowd. But it's almost like they've had a series of come-to-Jesus moments, to go on with the uh, phrasing, um, where basically it's like, okay, the formal organized religious thing is not working. We're going to do this different egalitarian thing. And there are some – I mean, they still do fundraising. They still – because obviously they're trying to keep the lights on and all that. But I've really been kind of trying to see if there's a way to, that they could be used kind of like a um, – you know, uh, you know, kind of like going to the back of the Vanu, uh, Vanu material, the classical Vanu material, where they mention about uh, Vanu as mini cultures and all that. You know, there are little Vanuans, the little you know, mm-hmm. pockets and all that. These guys could be one of those pockets, possibly. The thing that I am trying to be a good influence about is I'm really trying to break them hard on the reformism thing. And some of them, it, it, they're divided. Some of them really want to go vote. But they're not really interested in like reformers and like like the really hardcore stuff like the actors that like still do some protesting stuff. I know there's a Confederate statue thing here in Georgetown in the you know in one of the, it's one of the northern areas of Austin um, where they want to rip down a Confederate statue. Actually, I was there earlier today taking pictures of the statue they want to rip down, and it's very blase. It's just some it's just some dude in a Confederate uniform that says oh he was part of the Confederacy. Like that's it. And so, yeah, so some of them are either in the leftist influence kind of thing. But other than trying to rip down a statue and vote for whoever's running against whoever, you know, the blue, red, whatever, left, right paradigm stuff, other than that, they're actually pretty okay for the most part. So, hmm. again, maybe I can be a good influence, maybe not, you know. And here's the thing. If it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit, I can walk away. True. <clears throat> yeah. But, the, but, but, but in terms of, like, like I've even brought up Henry Thoreau specifically to these folks, and they're like, oh, yeah, we like him a lot. Like, that has never happened before. Anytime I brought up Henry Thoreau just as an example, or like Sander Spooner, or any of those 19th century type guys who are critical of the state, who are critical of organized religion, most of the time I just get shut down or left out of a room or told to leave or I'm not an American or whatever the criticisms are at the moment. But these, but these kind of quasi leftist boomer types, for whatever reason, they're like, yeah, that's that's good shit. And I'm like, okay, well, give up the voting and give up your silly protesting stuff, and we're on, we're in good shape because because the, that mutual aid thing, they they they've almost got it on lockdown. They're pretty close, man. Mm-hmm. So not perfect, not entirely consistent, but I think that they're a lot farther along than any of these other assholes who dress up in dresses and suits to compare clothing on Sundays. Yeah, that's what organized religious people do. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting to hear, man. And uh, I guess I, I, I kind of understand to a certain extent, because um, I mean, I'm sure we had some conversations like this back in 2015 or 2016, but um, I would have definitely consider myself, could have considered myself more atheist back then. But um, late 2019 and 2020 especially, um, I went back and reexamined a lot of things. Um, and I definitely didn't get to the same conclu- get to the same place and same conclusions as I did when I looked into some some of the stuff the first time. But um, yeah, I guess I, I would probably lie more in the realm of what what is it, what did you call it before? Like, uh, is it deism, um, which is uh, yeah. uh, I guess basically nature. Um, that's kind. Of, I mean, it's kind of where. Um, I mean, I wouldn't use that right. word deism, but yeah, you know what I'm talking about more so. If, you know, yeah, I guess. Right. So there's there's various there's various forms of irreligiosity that takes 20 million flavors, and these folks are mostly along those lines, not entirely consistent, but I'll, but to, to close out this topic, because I know we have those other things sure, to get yeah. to, I just want to mention this one last example. They have a lot of different, uh, like, like small, you could say action groups almost, if they were anarchists, where mm-hmm. either they get together and they do like mental health kind of, like, they even say the phrase about checking in with each other. They do like mental health kind of get together stuff, or uh, actually one thing I took part in, I did it once, so if anyone wants to laugh, feel free. It's a free country, at least it's supposed to be. I took part in a Wiccan drum circle in the church building. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a full I I think I did something with a tambourine or something at one point. Uh they had they had a uh they had a oh fuck what's it called? They had a food spread, uh coterie or coterie, whatever the French term is. Um charcuterie boards. It, it was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, charcuterie. Thank you. Yes, it was a full blown laid out charcuterie board, which I probably Shit, ate yeah. like in the eighth. Of. There was a lot of it, but but you know, again, what you know, for the for the folks at home, how many churches can you go to where one of the separate split off groups is a Wiccan drum circle? How many? And probably not many. That combined, right? And that combined with a lot of the actual genuinely good shit they do, 
Uh, you could call it community service through the first round term, but basically it's mutual aid. That's what it really is. Um, they've got a lot of good shit going on. Are they entirely consistent? No, of course not. They even say social justice, but their way, like I said earlier, their way of doing it is not, you know, rallying, shaming, and blaming, and all the all the stereotypical leftist stuff. It's more like, uh, you know, we 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 want. They're very much a kind of like an old left way of looking at things. They, they want to kind of have everyone to get together in Kumbaya. They're actually kind of pretty serious about the Kumbaya part. But again, don't let them probably be the enemy of the good here. So maybe I can steer them kind of away from the more distractive, somewhat destructive stuff, and more towards let's do more community service, well, for lack of a better term, more of the community service mutual aid stuff. Let's, hell, I mean, even they're actually setting up more, for lack of a better term, action groups to do, uh, like setting up a choir and I was even thinking about bringing up um, something about like a food co-op thing because uh, there was a really like lady who's like ancient uh, who was mentioning that she basically wants to do a whole feed the hungry thing, like a food pantry. Yeah. And I'm like that. That's very constructive. Like yes, do that. There's way too much food waste. They also are very environmentally conscious, but again, I want to steer that away from all the reformism stuff and away from voting for people and towards what do you do locally? Oh, you don't like food waste? Set up a food pantry. You no. Know, yeah, more the, direct, the direct action healthier. stuff. Yeah. 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 So let's drop the political crusading. So again, that part doesn't change, right? Let's drop the political crusading. Let's do the direct action, and we'll figure it out from there. And these folks are mostly direct action, but they still got that last little thing of political crusading. I'm just trying to get that away from them. So either they'll listen to me at, at the end of the day, or they won't. And. I'll have to make my decisions accordingly. But that's something I've been kind of trying to work with is kind of the irreligious, you know, the, the, the spiritual but not religious or irreligious people. Can they actually get their ass, you know, asses together? And, you know, here's the thing. They mostly have, with, before even I got there. They, they mostly have their shit together. It was actually kind of impressive to watch. But, again, I don't want to say the name of the particular uh, group, especially if we have a falling out or something. Yeah. I mean, if something happens, I mean, I have to go public with it. But for now... I want to kind of, it, it's almost like dating in some ways. I want to kind of let this develop a little bit. So that's been kind of positive where I'm kind of hanging around some people who are like former ministers and former this, and they're all disillusioned, but they do want to do something God-related, but they also want to do mutual aid. It's, it's like, okay, it's we're kind of, it's a transitionary thing, right? So also yeah. there was the, uh, there's, a, there's a possibility I might be joining a five-man band to actually play music during, you know, church time and all that, so. I'm gonna have to. I'm practicing with my ukulele now because <laughs> I, I've been slowly doing that. Now, now they want, but they want me to go up and perform uh, along with somebody else who has an acoustic guitar, and then like three other people who are gonna sing in like a choir. So, I'm trying to do some constructive extracurricular things as part of getting my life together, but also trying to develop Vanu uh, in in this particular area. So I, I hope that makes sense, but. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I mean, I'll obviously let you guys know how, how it turns out, but this is the first time I'm mentioning it because, yeah, the new hire, or, or excuse me, I said new hire, my bad. The uh, new member orientation thing was interesting with, yeah, you're an ex-minister, and you're an ex-minister, and you're an ex-minister. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I haven't seen as many ex-ministers <laughs> in, like, one room, like, ever. So I think that kind of says to, to what they're hopefully trying to accomplish, but um, that should be enough for now. Right on. All right. Well, yeah. Certainly appreciate that uh, that update, and uh, I guess uh, I guess some of that some of those details. Um, I suppose we'll go ahead and uh, and roll forward here. And like I said, I'll, most of the stuff regarding the background, I'll I'll leave to Seth for privacy. But um, just I guess yeah, for your sake, Kyle, and, and I guess yeah, for for probably plenty of audience members too. Um, I guess some some background on I guess the Bitcoin privacy space um, is probably in order because um, you know there was this this believe early on that bitcoin was anonymous and that was very quickly find out not to be not to be true um especially if um the bitcoin is acquired through kyc exchanges because then not only is there there are other you know i guess other um items of data that can you know tie up your bitcoin transaction to you but if you buy it from a kyc exchange then yeah obviously it's tied directly to your identity but um yeah bitcoin privacy has never never really been um it's never been good and uh the kind of disappointing part about it is that, um, and something that's when SW, um, uh, who SW, who we'll talk about, um, you know, momentarily, um, when he was on here before, you know, he's, he's been in the Bitcoin space since like 2013 and, um, focusing on Bitcoin privacy since, since 2015. 
And, um, yeah, he kind of saw there was this influx of people who only cared about um, the increasing price of Bitcoin. Um, and they started to, you know, become okay with custodians like, you know, Coinbase holding your Bitcoins or, in, you know, and just to use another relevant example, instead of owning your own gold or having gold in your possession, um, you know, some third party holds it for you. Um, that's silly. Um, but the justification is as long as number, as long as, you know, the price goes up, um, and you know, the, the well, you get more fiat stack at the end of the day, then that's, that's all that matters. Uh, and any privacy, you know, um, additions were out the door because especially for these folks um if you put more privacy enhancements on bitcoin then the general public won't eat, won't, won't want to use it as much um because you know it'll be used for money laundering and all these terrible things um so yeah bitcoin privacy's never never really been great which is why samurai wallet was um you know came about i think it was 2015 when they when they came when they came about and they're, they're really the only ones um i mean this we've talked about again we've talked about this on this podcast before but they're the only really the only 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 privacy tool in the space um in, in the bitcoin space um but yeah what they discovered uh is that that privacy on bitcoin you have to acquire it anonymously um again not through coinbase or any other exchange like that um uh, connect to the internet um or any bitcoin network via tor um which they had their own custom implementation of tor called sorbon and uh for good measure go ahead and coin join your coins through whirlpool to provide your privacy going forward um maybe uh use samurai's tool ricochet um, so instead of your, your Bitcoin transaction just going into the next the next block, uh, you can stagger it a few blocks out, um, which is really helpful if people are going to buy uh, or, you know, try to deposit at a KYC exchange to, to go out or, you know, uh, vice versa. Um, a lot of exchanges won't, um, they won't, you know, touch, they won't touch certain coins. So if you use Ricochet, then um, they only go a few steps back in the history, in the transaction history. So it, it's, um, I guess, a way to, I guess, subvert some of those protocols. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it's quite complex, um, but thank thankfully SW and TDEV made it very easy with Samurai. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I, I suppose um, beyond that, um, Samurai made big donations to the Tor Foundation, um, executive produced uh, Death Athletic, as I mentioned before. Um, and Kyle, this, was a, this is a documentary that came out in November, I think, of last year um, by a documentarian, Jessica Solse, who I interviewed on this podcast. But uh, she was uh, looking for, um, you know, some funding to finish the documentary. And uh, the uh, um, Samurai Wallet folks stepped in to uh, executive produce it. And basically, it was the, the story of um, uh, the docu uh, documentary covering the story of Cody Wilson, uh, 3D printed guns, um, crypto anarchy, etc. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very relevant to what we're talking about today. But um, the other relevant part of, the, part of this, Kyle, um, was when I was living in Austin, I went to that defense attributed press conference. Um, well, you can see me in the back of the back of the room in the documentary, and um, even a, a minute or two of um, the podcast made it in there, so you can hear me for a minute or two. Um, they're at about the hour mark. If anyone's inter interested in checking that out, but um, yeah, I guess I guess the, the long and short of it is that the, the folks at Samurai made a huge impact on the Bitcoin and even Monero privacy spaces. Um, when they were arrested, they just released the first stage um, in both. Um, atomic swaps between uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin and Monero, and decentralizing the Whirlpool coordinator. Whirlpool coordinator. Um, so to elaborate real quick, um, atomic swaps are ways to swap coins from one chain to another. Um, you know, just using I guess uh, some smart contracts or you know hash time lock contracts. I like guess usually what's used in Bitcoin, um, rather than via third party. So this is a way for if someone wants, to, someone has Monero and someone has Bitcoin, you don't need a third party in the middle. You can, it can just be totally done. You know, peer to peer. Um, you know, going from one coin to another. And, and there were a lot of interesting privacy. Um, you know, a lot of privacy opportunities um, opened up with a, with with a tool like that. Um, and they had just released, I guess, the, the alpha of it. And, and thankfully, the atomic swap technology will, will certainly um, continue to develop, you know, with or without them. But, you know, obviously, I, I, I would certainly would have left them to finish their project and, you know, not be facing the, the shit that they're facing. Um, and I guess, again, Kyle, I'm not sure how much you know about it, but Whirlpool was um, the coin join service um, that they offered. Um, but unfortunately, it still relied on a centralized coordinator at that point. Uh, and once that was taken down, coin joining stopped. Um, and yeah, again, they're working towards a solution, but the DOJ got to them first. So, um, I guess the, the next thing I want to do real quick is, um, you know, I guess in the history of our, you know, political prisoners, um, you know, I guess past, whatever you want to call it. Um, so they are facing conspiracy to commit money laundering, um, wire fraud, uh, computer, computer, uh, violations of computer fraud and abuse act and operating unlicensed money transmitting business. Um, and this is all available for anyone that wants to check it out. Um, if you just go to libertyattack.com forward slash um, SW, 
uh, then it will take you to um, the archive that needs to be updated. But I, I haven't, I haven't got the the doc. I guess they haven't even updated um, on Core Listener. Um, they haven't pulled in the most recent update from Pacer yet, so we'll get that updated as soon as I can. But um, basically, yeah, I guess it was on April 25th. Um, SW was arrested in Pennsylvania, and TDEV was arrested in Portugal, and he's still um, TDEV's still awaiting extradition from Portugal. Um, but SW was in court on Tuesday um, for the first, I guess, the first appearance. And um, it was, uh, um, yeah, it was pushed back to September, I think it was September 4th. Um, so it'll be, it'll be drug out, um, you know, a decent amount longer. Um, not going to be uh, necessarily anything quick, but let's, for, I guess, let's get a little more background here. And again, this is going to be from freedom.tech. But uh, uh, an absolutely shocking turn of events, the U.S. Department of Justice has moved on from Tornado Cash to the next privacy tool in the cryptocurrency space on their list, an incredible Bitcoin wallet called Samurai Wallet. Um, so taking the blueprint from their indictment of the Tornado Cash founders, the DOJ is now indicting the two founders of Samurai Wallet, charging them each with one count. Oh, again, that's what I was just said. Basically facing 25 years. Um it's only an indictment, but anyway, this is the this is the important and relevant parts. Um, so there were um, there were and I'll jump in here for for just a minute. Um, there was a a, a a Bitcoin mixing service, and it's very important. Coin joins versus mixing. Um, Bitcoin Fog was um, a mixing service where, um, yeah, you would literally you would physically send custody of your coins to someone else, and then hope that they would send you back different coins. Um, and that was how it worked. And if you look at anything in the financial world, the big thing is taking custody. Of, so if you take someone else's, you take custody of someone else's coins, a whole bunch of regulations come into that. Whether it's KYC, like know your customer, or um, just yeah, other other stuff that that you don't want to, you know, becoming a money transmitter, you know, getting a license for that. Um, not fun. Um, not something. Not something you want to do. Uh, and then there was Tornado Cash, which was an Ethereum. Um, I guess an Ethereum service per se. Um, but I, I think it was, for, from my understanding, it, it was uh, just it was just a smart contract. So it was developers put together the smart contract, and it was. I think it was coin joining. I don't think it was mixing. It wasn't. I don't think it was custodial. But um, the uh, yeah, t- Tornado Cash um, was a coin join on on Ethereum, and just. Um, I think it was the day that, or the day that, um, I guess the day I was recording the pod, a couple days later after the act- actual arrest, um, the Tornado Cash, um, I guess, decision came out, and and the the developer, um, the coder was um, like he's facing five years, um, five years in prison. They're going to appeal, but, um, and then you have Samurai, um, which returning to Freedom Tech, um, how Samurai Wallet worked. Uh, Samurai Wallet, unlike many of the other Bitcoin mixers previously prosecuted by the DOJ, had one vital vital difference. Uh, they never took custody of users' funds. Uh, Samurai Wallet has was an entirely self-custodial wallet requiring users to save their seed phrase and pass phrase in order to restore funds. While it did provide privacy features like Whirlpool and Ricochet, as mentioned in the indictment, at its core was a self-custodial Bitcoin wallet. Um, let me see if there, I'm skipping forward a little bit. But there are two vital things to understand about Whirlpool and how it functions. Um, Samurai Wallet never had custody of funds, nor say in where funds are sent. Each user retains full custody of funds, and their wallets will only sign transactions um, to ensure their funds are sent back to them in the Whirlpool round. So all all their, all their coordinator do is is doing, and it's all encrypted anyway, so technically speaking, they can't even read the messages. But all they're doing is coordinating, um, you know, signing messages and making sure that, you know, all the signatures are valid and such, and that things go as planned. Um and then the ricochet, their other tool men- the other tool mentioned in the indictment simply allowed users to put distance on chain between them and a previous transaction, giving more plausible deniability to their activity. Um, and I'll jump in again um, and going along with what um, you know, talking to SW, um, I guess just I guess the research they put out um, with Bitcoin, the privacy really comes down to um, it's it's adding as much plausible den- deniability as possible. Um, you know, um, you know, as as little information as you can leave on the on the public Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, it's obviously the yeah, obviously the goal. Um, as much plausible deniability. It's not like Monero, where you might actually be able to have you know um, anonymous transactions in that sense. But um, so continuing on, um, what's also vital to understand when it comes to Ricochet is that Samurai Wallet never has custody of funds or any say in where funds are sent. Samurai Wallet merely accepted Bitcoin transactions you signed via their app and sent them to the broad sent them to broadcast to the Bitcoin network at random intervals. As you alone hold your private keys that sign these transactions, they cannot be altered in any way by the Samurai Wallet server. Before the case against Tornado Cash, the technical fun- function of Samurai as a self-custodial wallet 
uh, would traditionally be enough to absolve them of any responsibility to register as a money transmission business or perform onerous KYC AML regulations on their users as they are never materially involved in the execution of transactions. Um, and he says you can go check out more Tornado Cash. But um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess. Um, So yeah, I guess the the overall crypto war update, Kyle. Um, you know, um, I talked to Diverter, someone who was on, um, who worked, you know, closely with the samurai samurai guys, um, and uh, yeah, it was definitely a loss, definitely a loss, and and the Bitcoin privacy rule. Because now Bitcoin at this point, um, I mean, after after this happened, after the samurai wallet folks were developed for, were arrested. Um, I guess there were it, it caused a chain reaction of chilling dissent across the across the crypto and the entire crypto, not even just Bitcoin, the whole entire crypto privacy you know space. Um, some services shut down out of fear because um, there's I guess the the old definition that they were that all of these businesses were being built upon were operating off of I think 2019 FinCEN guidance, and then from this uh, from this most recent thing they basically said that FinCEN doesn't matter. I guess the DOJ said FinCEN doesn't matter. Um, anymore, and now no one knows what the fuck the laws actually say. Um, so there, there, there was. Um, I guess very early on, even I guess back to when we when we talked about this stuff a lot more, Kyle. Um, you know, that was one of the big things. Is like, well, how is this stuff going to be? How is Bitcoin or crypto going to be? You know, seen? Um, like, no one has any idea. Like, what's it's, a, it's basically an entire thing was a gray area. Well, there was actually some delineation and like some some clarity, and then now that's all um, all off the off the table again, and the ramifications are are pretty are pretty far reaching. Um, and again, this still has to be adjudicated. But um, I mean, if you think about it, like the, these are just open source developers. Um, on projects, they don't like. There's no. Um, that's they were just coders. They would, had nothing to do with you know money transmission. I mean, in the samurai wallet, they didn't even have the U.S. dollar, uh, U.S. dollar in there. It was just satoshis and Bit and BTC. So there was no, literally no money transmission whatsoever. They didn't even deal with any anything that you know they would define the state would define as quote unquote money, because um, they don't want to you know acknowledge Bitcoin as money, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's to the point now. Like, uh, um, and this is this again. This is why there's a lot of chilling dissent, which you know all about. I mean, you wrote the um, you wrote um, that article on Dragnet wiretapping a little while back, which I guess is another another stage of this crypto war. In a separate, in a separate, um, in a separate uh, article, on chilling dissent itself by the same name. Yeah, where people basically get just demonized based on either their political activities or ideo or ideological flavor of the month or whatever that. Uh, the establishment base, whatever establishment it is, basically deems to be unfit or unsuitable and such. And notice also too here, folks, um, the state doesn't like competition. You know, there's the old. Uh, I think Ron Paul had something on his desk a while back about don't don't steal. The government hates competition. Or mm -hmm. in, in this case, it would be you know don't don't out, try not to out compete the state. Right? I mean, that's, or at least that's the that's the propaganda message basically. I.e., if you try to out compete, the state will come after you. But then again, it's like, okay, so let's look at this. Let's let's go over the theory of the five markets yet again, okay? So obviously white market is your Federal Reserve notes and the assorted coinage, your pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, dollars, half dollars, and so forth, even the $2 bill. Um, your black market money would be, so I'll give someone an example here, and then, of course, your crypto would basically be your gray market, generally speaking. And a lot of the overreach and regulatory, what you who's it, possible regulatory capture is basically where the white market is essentially trying to basically assimilate the gray market currency unto itself by building relationships, quote unquote, with the Bitcoin Foundation, like I wrote about several years ago and other similar things, where they basically try to co opt it, is what I'm really trying to say. And so, yeah, I guess. I guess your red market version of this would be what? Counterfeit currency? Your counterfeit Federal Reserve notes and all that? Um, which, of course, is illegal. You can't just, you know, can't just print out like a $100 bill just because you feel like it, right? Um, but yeah, that would be kind of an interesting question of itself. I mean, what would be considered the truly counter economic, the truly agorist uh, currency or set of currencies today? Would that be Bitcoin? Would it be Monero? Would it be Ethereum? Would it be this one or that one? I mean, last time great, I checked, it's a great, great I mean, question. And until April 25th, I would have said Bitcoin still. And 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 this was this has been my I I was whenever I was in Austin, I would, I call I would call myself a Bitcoin maximalist, like it was Bitcoin or nothing. But again, I saw. <laughs> but again, I saw like 
um, I saw this shit on Twitter where like these, you know, the, these these Bitcoiners were, I guess, more status than some of the right wingers that um, that I know. And it's like, like again, it's it's all about it's all about the price. Um, they don't care about KYC or anything like that. It's just as long as anything that they can do, you know, for the price to go up. And I was like, you know, I'm not sure how much longer Bitcoin's going to be viable. So like, I'm I'm going to start, you know, you know, using Monero kind of disgruntledly. I never I've never had good luck with the software. Thankfully, I, I, at that time, thankfully now I've I've got my my stack my technology stack pretty pretty decent but um yeah i started working in monero because i i kind of i mean i mean we all saw this everyone saw this coming i mean sw and i talked about it um numerous times um numerous times but um privacy was 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 just secondary to bitcoin um and and at, and, and at this point like uh without some of the similar without some some of those similar wallet tools um it's uh bitcoin privacy is a lot a lot a lot more difficult um than it was before. So to, I guess, to answer your question, to, to jump in on, I guess, my view, um, at least right now, and I'm not, again, like that, you know, we're talking about chilling descent and how things kind of, you know, like a loss and one loss, um, in the overall, um, you know, one, one loss of a battle and an overall arching crypto war. But, um, I guess the, the other part of this is this is open source software. So eventually people are going to set up their own decentralized coin joins. Um, the code's already out there. Um, and you know, it's going to be a whole hell of a lot of risk for the, per for the person that does it, which means they're going to have, I mean, all, all this is doing is forcing open, co open source developers who are doing, who are do doing, do doing nothing but, you know, code, which, you know, going back to, you know, pre codes, free speech, like it's, it's first amendment issue. Um, so this, this is like the, um, this is, um, it's forcing open source developers to, to be basically anonymous, um, online and to do, to do a lot of stuff, you know, to work in the shadows, which, um, you know, obviously for, for the white market folks, they don't like that. But for me, it's like, yeah, that like, this is dangerous shit, obviously. Um, like, it's not like, it's not just like, yeah, it's not something to just, you know, do haphazardly. Um, so that will, you know, that will be, that will be a reality, but at least for, for the current time, I mean, this, at least until September, um, and obviously this this, this trial is going to go on for a year or two. I mean, year, it's probably going to be a long battle, you know, years, I would think, um, as these usually as these usually do. Um, at least until September, so um, it's going to be a few months. And for folks like me who you know used use Bitcoin a lot, you know, day to day or um, things like that, it, it it was a major major kind of yeah major blow because um, yeah the only real privacy on Bitcoin was thanks to Samurai Wallet, so. Um, yeah, and then you can get conspiratorial about it too, and how I think it was the day before they were arrested, they released their um, <laughs> the alpha, I guess the first stage for decentralizing Whirlpool. Which at that point, if they would have gotten that software up and running in like 25 countries, um, or if there were you know 25 or 250 coordinators, um, it would have been really hard to put back into the bottle. Um, so I don't know. It's yeah. Anyway, um, I'll stop there and well, let you jump in if you have anything. The only thing, last thing I want to say about this before we get to the next topic is, again, I want to reiterate, and this is something for the listeners to kind of really contemplate about and perhaps even suggest possible answers. But what count? I mean, okay, first a premise and then the question. We need free market currencies or even commodities that function as money that is outside the control of the state, period. So therefore, when we're looking at the market selection of actual genuine free market currency slash commodities that function as money, what are our options? Now, I know some of the greenbacker type people, who I guess you think would be like the old leftists, they were very big on locally issued currency uh, that would be backed by either an actual real good or commodity or, or by something else. I know there was like the example of the Ithaca hours. Um, and things like that. Now, obviously, there are limitations to that kind of thing. Like local currencies don't really help if you need to, you know, do, do business like across state lines or something, or even outside your local municipality, your local county, and so forth. So there are limitations to these kinds of things. Also, bullion, your gold, your silver, your fill-in precious metal here. Um, again, limitations with that, although there have been some developments such as uh, having them be uh, essentially uh, sold in like smaller amounts, especially something like gold in particular, right? But again, if you need to, uh, shall we say, not physically transmit money, then yeah, unfortunately, kind of fall back into the crypto wars, unfortunately. So, or, or shall we say, go non-local. If it's non-local, then yeah, unfortunately, we're kind of relying on the outcome of, of the crypto wars such as they are. Uh, and all that. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a reason, as you can see, it's not just the church thing I was kind of mentioning earlier. 
is also like even money related issues, or shall we say money alternatives, or shall we say second realm currencies or counter economic uh, uh, commodities as money, or you know, the similar terms meaning more or less the same thing, right? Um, alternatives to the state, right? Things that are not Federal Reserve notes and all that. By the way, as a brief segue right before getting on to the next topic, I do want to mention this because I think Joe a lot of it. Mm-hmm. The current job, uh, private security job that I have with a major armored car company that shall remain unnamed for obvious reasons being obvious, um, approximately one-third of the work that we do is not the driving and it's not the, shall we say, rudimentary private security work uh, that, you know, got my license for and all that. So, the, you know, the fighting, the shooting, the legal stuff, the handcuffing and so forth. Um, the other third of it is servicing ATMs. It is freaking complicated as shit to just open up an ATM and then having the, I don't want to get too much into details for, for obvious security reasons, but the short version basically is disabling the alarm, opening the safe, and a couple of things I can't talk about, just to get access just to the Federal Reserve note. Never mind anything else, never mind balancing the accounts and pressing 20 million buttons, and then of course, clo- and then swapping out the cash and then closing everything back up again. So if anybody ever mentioned about uh, first realm ATMs being like the bee's knees and all that, I'd say bullshit. You need an actual human being, or as the case is here, apparently a security guard, a specialized trained one in this case, to actually access the machine, service it, do whatever needs to be done, because again, the deposit pulls are different from cash swaps, which are different from a couple other things. There's different procedures depending on what the client needs, and the client being a bank, of course, a traditional or excuse me, a first realm big bank type, right? Because there's also all those issues too. Because yeah. uh, it's an oligopoly, as, as the listeners well know. But but like it still requires humans to still do stuff like in person. And of course, the number one thing that all of us are worried about is us getting fucking robbed at gunpoint, because that is not an idle thing. I mean, type in you know, pick a favorite armored car company slash robbery, and you will see all sorts of news clips, whether recent or whatever, about guys. There was one where, um, where a guard got his pants fucking ripped off hmm. in public. He even helped the guy because he didn't want to die because he wasn't that committed. And I'm sorry, but like my attitude is completely different when it comes to that. But I'm just saying, like this isn't like some idle existential thing. This is a real thing that's done. So all I'm saying is for all the statists who love their ATM machines with their first-round money Federal Reserve notes, just understand but there is a security guard for an armored car company somewhere who is willing to risk his life and get paid, of course, to service that ATM that you guys love so much because you guys don't like using crypto or you guys don't want to use local notes or use bullion or any sort of other you know, free market alternatives because you guys want your Federal Reserve notes or an ATM. Well, guess what? The trade-off, among other trade-offs, besides the inflation and the taxes and whatever else, is a security, a specialized security guard for an armored car company has to go and service that to ATM and do whatever he needs to do, the very technical work, and somehow also keep himself alive while doing it and not get robbed. Like, there's so much... It's just like, oh, my fucking God. It's, it's, it's so obnoxious. Now, I'm okay because I have experience, so, you know, if I need to lay a motherfucker out, I'm going to have to make a decision when the time comes, God forbid. But you see what I'm saying. It's, it's just like... This is just insane. These people, like, I love, I, and I come across people like this even recently, uh, Shane. They're like, I love my ATM machines. I don't want to ever use all the alternative currencies. The crypto stuff is all a scam. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, really, what's the trade off? What's the alternative? The alternative is that you have to deal with the ATMs and the robberies and all that. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that, know, and that's, yeah, and that's, that's, and that's a good point. Help. Yeah. yeah, it's that's a good point. So, like, I, I'm with you. Like, even, um, even just like, like cash is, is you know, privacy friendly as long as you know you know cash cash payments are, are you know yeah pretty decent obviously the the money behind it is, is not um but i i guess the at this it, it seems like like with uh you know talk, talking about samurai wallets um, developers getting hammered and tornado cash and then the roman sterling off case which is related to the bit to the bitcoin fog one that i mentioned earlier um at, like there's there's a lot. Um, I mean, there you know obviously there's been a big push, and I didn't really give give, give too much credence you know credence to this. Like you know, maybe it's five ten years, um, but kind of kind of for the same reason that, that you're laying out here. Um, that like uh, like uh, you know I I was kind of um, less concerned um, you know about a potential central bank digital currency, um, 
be kind of what you're saying. People love their ATMs. They love their checks. And like, especially in like the small town that I'm in, um, to get like these people to just use like a straight up CBDC only and no cash, not going to happen. Um, just probably logistically not going to happen. But I guess to your point though, like I, I guess the, the opposite part of this is that, um, like most things are like most everything is going digital. Um, and, um, you know, te- you know, technology is a neutral tool as we've talked about many, many times before. Um, and there's, there's going to be the, the slavery and the totalitarian applications of it. And there are also those that, you know, we can use for, for freedom and that, you know, we should try to promote as, as alternatives, um, to some of this dystopic nonsense that's come down the pike. So, um, yeah, I guess there's a couple, a couple of different elements there. No, I agree. And so, yeah, the only thing I was going to say about this was just that, yes, do there need to be better ways that are more efficient, that optimize, I don't know, the use of, you know, local cur- locally privately issued currencies and or bullion and or crypto in a way where you could, let's say, greater adoption, right? Here, here's an interesting question. Can you pay your rent using crypto or bullion or locally issued private banknotes? Uh, well, so or, well, actually, for the or services like bill, BitRefill, or, you can, yeah, with with like BitRefill, you can yeah. even utility bills. Um, you can pay with Bitcoin, um, or like a number of different other um, cryptocurrencies. Um, and there are people and who awesome. there are there are people who for the I guess and they don't just use Bitcoin, but um, for past like eight years or whatever, they've been they've been you know crypto only. Um, so yeah, like whether it's Bitcoin, you know, whether it's, you know, gift cards or, um, uh, Visa or master, like prepaid MasterCard or Visa gift cards for like your online purchases for like Amazon or Amazon gift cards. Um, you can get everything off Amazon. Um, not saying it's, you know, yeah. optimal to, you know, producing yourself or getting it locally. But the point is you can certainly, you can most certainly survive off of, um, you know, you know, live off of, off of, off of crypto. Obviously it's not super easy with, with, you know, the, um, bull runs and the bear runs, but, um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, yeah, it's not just yeah. yeah, and I guess yeah, the the other aspect of, of Bitcoin too is the which which I think it it is. Um, I talked about it with I talked about this with Jamin a uh, couple up well, I guess last episode with him. But uh, the other problem with Bitcoin, it's not it's not a problem though. It's the, one of the trade offs of the Bitcoin is the block size, um, where anyone can run their own node because it's only like 500 gig- gigabytes, um, to more or less to download the entire blockchain, um, because the block size is low. It's like two megabytes or whatever it is, um. And a lot of folks, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember, like, the, the scaling wars, you know, when Bitcoin cash, the Bitcoin cash fork happened. Um, it's like, we need unlimited, like, basically, like, we need the, the blockchain to, the blocks, the blockchain size to be whatever, or the block size to be whatever, you know, is necessary, you know, for, for transactions, like Visa level. And, um, but then you run into, I guess, the, the, uh, the third Bitcoin fork. Um, oh, gosh, what's the, uh, it's, it's basically irrelevant now, so I can't even, I'm not sure if I'll, oh, BSV, um, where they wanted, like, the entire, world computer to be on a bitcoin blockchain and this is where you run into um like apparently there was in the past couple of years there's this baby born in india it was the first blockchain baby and they gave it a, a you know a number and just like on the bitcoin blockchain um you know you can t- take that address and pull up all the previous transactions so-called transactions well now that entire baby's medical record and entire life everything she does is going to be registered to that one thing but that one you know address basically so yeah there are like the 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 great thing about the bitcoin blockchain is it's expensive to use so you can't just go and willy-nilly just toss in all sorts of like the unlimited amount of data that you would for some of these i guess some of these you know smart cities and such these that they're you know trying to you know, come out especially in like china and india and some of these places um still a little further i guess may, maybe I'm, i mean i haven't been to new york city in a long time so i can't speak from experience but i think the us might be a little behind but i don't know no no i feel you um but again a lot of this is going to require a lot of development and unfortunately i guess we're going to find out from the courts whether they're going to hang these guys from their petards and make an example of them like the mafiosi or the kimura do and then we'll kind of see where the state of things are, are at that time. And, you know, like, here's the thing. Even worst case scenario, even if every single one of these guys affiliated with uh, the Samurai Wallet thing or, or anything else that matter, even if they do, again, worst case scenario, get convicted and sentenced based on, you know, uh, whatever the charges were about the... It, the exact wording doesn't matter. Right. If they get convicted of whatever the state is throwing at them, um, frankly, as far as the, as the counter-economics of them are concerned, all this would be for the rest of us is like, okay, maybe we need to be just a little bit more careful about how to skirt around some stuff, and then we find some new techniques and we get around. Bingo. It. Yep. Ex- I mean, exactly. Ex- and that's it's, that's it's exactly the point. Receipt. Yep. It's at, yeah. Uh, it's all, like these, yep. Exactly. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. You're right. No. Yeah, you're exactly right. 
No, 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 that, that, that was it. It's just worst case. And I know we need to get to our, our last topic, but yeah, that was the only thing I was going to say. But again, guys, worst case scenario, even if these guys become, shall we say, political prisoners, segue, way, even if they become political prisoners, yes, that's not good for them. Yes, they are kind of uh, de facto martyrs, question mark, in a manner of speaking, but it's just instructive for the rest of us. Um, to basically maybe not maybe do some things they did, maybe not do some other things, they use it as an instructive lesson, and then just use it, you know, in a more effective counter-economic way to get around the state. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess uh, I'll just uh, to close this out, and I guess for the uh, getting over to the political prisoner stuff, um, so I don't remember the website for the, I'll put it in the show notes, but I remember off the top of my head the actual donation website, but freesamurai.org, or is it freesamurai.com? freesamurai.com. Um, links will be in the show notes, um, but uh, definitely consider. Um, I mean, I, Kyle, we talked about you know Daniel legal legal defense funds before, um, but usually that's because um, they're a scammy nature. Um, you know, you know something by you know alternative alternative uh, media, and usually not not you know upright depends, and moral it things. Depends, <laughs> it depends who's running an activist yeah. legal defense fund scam because it's not all legal defense fund scams that are uh, that legal exactly. defense funds that are scams. Exactly. It's so usually it's, activist <laughs> funds where somebody has like, uh, an agenda. Yeah. Yes. So in this case, I I would most certainly recommend folks. Um, I mean, this is um, um, the precedents that this could set um, are are pretty are pretty huge and in, in, in a bad way. Um, so Kyle, you'll, you'll, you'll find this funny. Um, so this, this is actually, I, I, you know, I, the screenshot was getting shared around on Twitter, but it was the tornado cash ruling and they were kind of talking about custody and they're trying to change that definition of custody so that anyone who runs like a note or anything, um, can be considered a money transmitter and then have to, you know, fall under the purview of licensing and such. And, um, they actually brought in, it's crazy. Um, the example they used to demonstrate that you don't actually have to have fun, like, c- c- you know, like actual custody of funds, like take possession of them um, to be considered a money transmitter. The example they used was just because the flame that you cook your egg on in the morning doesn't actually have custody of the, it was some retarded thing, like trying to show that like that, like frying your egg and like the way that just because um, I don't remember the exact, the exact thing, but there, it, it was retarded. Like I, I, I mentioned that yeah, people can go listen to the TDEV or I guess the, um, the, uh, diverter episode, but they whatever. Anyway, talking about transferring heat, yeah, it's like, really like this, uh, is, I, I like, this you... it doesn't even make sense. I can't, even, I can't even like recall it. Um, but it's so retarded. The, uh, it doesn't even make I, sense. I think you mentioned this either in a previous episode or maybe it was a private conversation or something, but, but either way, yes, I've heard something like this and, and here's how long the short of it, folks. Lawyers, make for great, uh, excuse me, lawyers make for terrible engineers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being a lawyer is being a lawyer, being an engineer is being an engineer, being a scientist, being a scientist, being a truck driver is being a truck driver. Um, these are different skill sets that do different things. And the one problem I've noticed with a lot of lawyers, whether they be prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, or other, is they try to overstep the, the limits of their knowledge and act as if they know about something outside mm-hmm. the realm of their understanding yeah. degree where they sound smart, but in fact they're not if you actually take five seconds and think through it. And therefore when you get, like, okay, let's go to a classic example real quick. So, like, there is the, the legal standard for what is pornography. What is pornography, legally speaking, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the legal standard has been, since I can fucking remember, unless it's been changed, is that you know it when you see it, literally. <laughs> pornography is you know when you see it well i mean jesus christ if i fucking pulled my pants down in front of the local police station and show my bare ass at the police station and moon them they might consider that pornography you know when you see it right so and, and there is nudity involved if hypothetically i were to do that as a form of uh my victimless crime uh, you know my victimless crime of the day or the week or whatever and it's public nudity, so yeah, Texas Penal Code will apply to some degree. I might be put on a sex re- register, <laughs> sex, sex, re- sex offender registry if I hypothetically did that, because I've known people who pissed in public, who urinated in public because they were drunk and didn't, you know, whatever, and then they got slapped with whatever the hell, and they're now on the sex offender registry, even though they didn't hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. No forcible rape, no molestation, none of the typical stuff, no kidnapping. All they did was piss, and now they're felons. And worse, on the sex offender registry in particular. So, yes, if I were to go, or anyone for that matter, where hypothetically you could go in front of the police station, drop your trousers and moon them for like five minutes, or two minutes, or 30 seconds, 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, I, I guess that's pornography, I suppose. That's pornography. It's also legal, blah, blah. You see where I'm going with this, right? <clears throat> right, so, yeah, yeah. It's basically whatever they say, whatever they say it is, and they they can prosecute who they want to. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously the we've, I think we've we talked about this before. Um, but yeah, I mean the the uh, the yeah, you can leave it up to the judge's interpretation. Um, and and to do that in the what Southern District of New York, um, is not not good. That's where Ross Ulbricht was convicted. These are the assholes that do a lot of this sort of shit. And I guess just to to wrap this up, um. Yeah, and that's like I, I, I yeah. Anyway, um, anyway, go donate, go donate, go, go donate to their to the legal defense fund. It's worthwhile. Go ahead, Kyle. No, the other thing I was gonna add real quick is that here's the other problem with having such arbitrary and, and obtuse definitions. For really, anything, especially in a legal uh, of a legal issue, where the state's gonna get involved, or they want to try to force an excuse for them to get involved, is that who is potentially eligible as a possible political prisoner in the future, has now widened, okay? We're going back to, like, the whole book on three felonies a day, okay? Mm. Like, that's how bad this is. So it's not just about definition of pornography or definition of being a fucking money transmitter or the definition of whatever the fuck the victim was crying is at the minute. Um, Meanwhile, there's, I can say for certain, as a professional security professional expert person, oh, wow, that came out badly, right? As a professional security what you who's it, let's call it that. I like that. I like that title better. As a professional security what you who's it, I can tell you for a fact I have seen felonies committed right in front of me that I was not allowed to act on because I'm not a cop. And when the actual cops, the actual blood, were did see in front of them, they refused to act on it. With actual victims, actual evidence, actual violations of the Texas Penal Code, and I, even when I got involved in a couple of cases, said, hey, please do the arrest or the whatever the hell or the criminal trespass or whatever the fuck I need to do. They should have, uh, and it was Austin Police Department specifically, and I will say that because they suck balls even according to all the mm-hmm. data. Um, I've had APD officers go to me and say no. I'm like, you just had a felony happen in front of you. You know, if it was literally on the other side of the property line, I would put the handcuffs on and hook them up. But I can't do that because there's actual like, legal limitations on what I can do. But you guys can do fucking whatever with your with your roadside stops, which I can't do, obviously, with your roadside stops and whatever else, and you literally saw a felony happen. And you're not and you literally just told me no. Oh. I wonder if that's me. Literally just told you no, and then you dropped. Let me see. And you ride oh. by the client. Hold on, hey, Kyle. And then that's the It cut out for it cut out for like fifteen, twenty seconds there. Okay. You can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're we're good. It just cut out for yeah, making sure you didn't drop out. Well, just to finish that thought off, mm-hmm. it kind of just begs the question that when felonies, even according to the state's own laws, when a felony is happening right in front of a so called peace officer, the bludge, and even me as private security, where I can't act on it because it's like a property line issue or something, and I ask and the police are already there for whatever reason, and I ask them, Hey, you know, felony, go get them, and they straight up tell me no to my face, then it's like, what fucking good are they for? And again, this isn't like a maybe so, maybe no thing. It, like, like a domestic, like I remember one time it was a domestic violence thing that was happening on the sidewalk. And it was loud and obnoxious, and it was like four in the morning or something. And, you know, it's just like, you know what? Like, at the end of the day, I do what I can to do right by my clients, and that's really all I can do, at least in the immediate moment, right? And yeah, there are certain things I can arrest for uh, that any one of us could really arrest for, like put handcuffs on and, and drag them before even a status judge or magistrate. Uh, preventing the consequences of theft, which is basically like the shoplifting, generally speaking. Uh, felonies committed in plain view, so obviously know your felonies. And then, of course, the broadest one, which is disorderly conduct slash immediate breaches of the peace. And there is there is a there is a uh, shade of gray with that one, but like. Even that arrest authority, even by the state, is still pretty limited uh, because it's basically just citizen's arrest, pretty much. Um, But the cops can just basically fucking do whatever they want, and they refuse to act on it even when you have an actual victim and an actual crime. So notice that contradiction right there. You have not just the cops, but all these other more political political prosecutions going after folks for the victimless crimes of the money transmitting or the other stuff we've talked about, or even like 
illicit narcotics related stuff or pornography or whatever it is, or, or some variant thereof where there's no victim. But then they are more than happy to do the roadside stops for traffic related stuff because of course enforcing arbitrary provisions of the Texas Transportation Code or any similarly related thing is of course very easy. Hell, I got pulled over twice somewhat recently. One was allegedly I was speeding, and the other one was allegedly I had improper placement of the front license plate because it was on the dash instead of on the bumper because it kept fucking fall, falling off the fucking bumper. <laughs> so, and I got let up with a warning twice only because they, for whatever reason, they asked me what I was doing and what I did for a living. I told them, and at the time I was doing the school security, not the armored cart stuff now, and all of a sudden they attitude changed like that by the bludge. And I'm just like, okay, so the only reason that I got off with a warning is because they perceive me as part of being the thin colored line of whatever. Because technically, the bludge are a thin blue line, and technically, guys like me are what's known as the thin purple line. Because apparently, we all have fucking different multicolored lines, like we're the fucking pride flag. Not that it's a bad thing, I'm just drawing a comparison, right? Uh, there's the pride flag that's multicolored, and now we have that's more technically considered traditionally left wing, and then we have the traditional right wing thing of multicolored American flags with blue lines and red lines and <laughs> purple lines. And I, I, th I think, what was it? Um, I know the EMT guys have their own version and, and, and the tow truck drivers are like yellow or something. And it's just like, wow, like peacocking much. You know, so don't, 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 and as, a, as a side note, please don't blame the alphabet people for having multicolored symbols and all that. The right wingers do it too with the thin lines of blue and red and purple and I, oh, green. Sorry, I forgot that one. Because that one's like for what? Park rangers and the feds or something? I forget. Um, so, so much, so much, so many colored lines and symbols and so forth. You know, it's like the people getting upset about the Confederate statue thing again. It's like, oh, Jesus, we're back to that again. So <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, look, can we please keep human beings out of government dungeons and cages? for things that are not actual crimes with an actual victim, please. Because the cops are willing to let the actual criminals walk around. I've watched them do it. So they're more than happy to enforce the victimless crime stuff, but they're more than happy to let a bunch of actual, real, genuine, dangerous, violent felons just run around, <laughs> just everywhere. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's not just in downtown Austin. It's just other places as well. It's not to belabor the point. You see the problem, right? They only... The so-called law enforcement only of the bludge really only wants to enforce the law so long as it's safe for them. Because remember, officer safety, right? They want to live long enough to collect on their pension. So that's the financial incentive right there. It's not just about revenue. Uh, it's not just about revenue collection for their department in the moment, like the speeding tickets and other things that are related to that. It's also they want to survive long enough to collect on the pension, which is where the real money is. So. It, it gets it gets messy and awful real fast, and it's like I really hate how the so-called public servants that are known as uh, peace officers or police officers are actually making more work for guys like me when they turn people, when they arrest people on on, on stuff that are technically felonies, but it's all victimless crime stuff. And now then the jails get overfilled, and then they let let out the actual real dangerous like MS-13 type guys. Right who are actually serious about running their rackets and so forth and doing the, doing the uh, trafficking, the real deal human trafficking stuff and all that violent shit that's related to that, uh, which doesn't use women and children and so forth and others, uh, people of color and, and whatnot. And they just, they just let all this happen because it's acceptable because it makes them money in part. I mean, that's part of it. You see what I mean? It's just whatever is easy for them not what you would think they're supposed to do, even according to their own laws and their own, you know, when they get sworn in as cops and so forth. It's just, it, it, it's wonderfully and amazingly corrupt. And then at the capstone to it is they get angry at guys like me because we actually are trying to do right by our clients to protect person and property as per our contract. Because we do their job better than they can, even with the handicapped limitations we legally have on ourselves. That's sad, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, we've talked um, in private conversations about some of these things, um, about how, I mean, obviously, you know, how, you know, anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, 
yeah, I'm, I imagine it cannot be fun being private security in this highly fascist world. Um, I guess I'll just leave it there for for the moment, um, and we'll we'll jump forward here to um, the judicial transparency topic. And I don't even know how I want to introduce this. I I, I usually I, I put together outlines usually just to you know keep the important thoughts, you know, on hand. But I don't I'm not sure how I want to start this. Um, basically. I guess we we wrote an article back in like 2016, I think, Kyle, um, called "The Libertarian Case for Judicial Transparency," and this was following um, just some some travesties of cases, um, both in you know just nature of of them, like you know um, folks like Kevin Casey Massey, or um, travesties of cases like uh, um, like Charles Dyer, where it wasn't necessarily like the um, the case; it was his so-called supporters. Um, so, like, the, the judicial transparency issue is um, at all levels, but um, I guess, um, yeah, there's there's some, some positive developments in this realm, but I, I don't know. I guess I, I just, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you, I mean, what what, do you, what background do you want to provide on our, 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 you know, judicial transparency, political prisoners archive? So what I would recommend, just not just for purposes of time regarding this particular episode, but also because there's a lot of background information too. I encourage That's everybody why I, got, to start I, I didn't know I didn't know where to start. Like where where the hell do you start? So, so so I would start with reading the article and then just start downloading like everything from all the links and all that. And here's and here's the reason why. A lot of court documents are behind a paywall. If it's the feds, it's Pacer. If it's otherwise, it's the other things. Um, the problem with the current status setup of the so-called judiciary branch is that. They're treated more like star chambers, like out of the Soviet Union. And so whatever classically liberal notions you have about due process, about fill in the blank, or even alleged notions of civil rights, uh, you just need to kind of grow up and throw all that stuff out the window. Because that's not the reality. The reality is that you're dealing with a combination of vested self-interests who run the judiciary like it's a set of uh, star chambers that effectively let me put it this way it's kind of like looking at family law courts right um even though it's usually treated as a civil matter although there are some criminal elements especially there's a domestic violence angle to it um, but usually they're treated more as civil matters right uh whether it's divorce proceedings child custody or other i mean even before my own life fell the hell uh fell completely the fuck apart um i already knew that the family law courts because that was one of my political field trips Mm. was to a county court and with the family law. Yeah. And I wrote all the, yeah, and if people want to look that up, it's one of the articles that was part of that series and going through the different details of all the horrendous shit I saw. And that was a team a day. I actually, I didn't put this in the article. I should have. I just remembered it right now for some reason, but actually I did talk to one of the uh, stated, uh, uh, well, I should say government employees that were there, some sort of clerk. And I asked, I even asked, is this kind of, is, is, this, is this the kind of stuff that's normal? You know, day in and day out of business, really, because it's right, political field trip, you're supposed to experience government as normal habitat and all that. So I was asking the question, if this is the normal day for you guys, basically. And what that clerk told me, and I feel stupid, I should have put this in the article all those years ago. She told me, this is a tame day, like a lighter day, like a not exciting day, or even not a normal day. This is a tame, calmer day. All I'm thinking is, like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, I thought I just went through, like, whatever circle of, you know, Dante's circle of hell I just walked through. I mean, pick a circle yeah. at this point. And, and this clerk, who would be in a position to know, who probably has no incentive to lie or exaggerate to me or anyone else, basically claims this was a tame, calmer day. I'm like, good fucking guy. I, I don't even want to know what a normal day looks like, much less a hellish one. And this is family law court kind of stuff. So never mind the bankruptcy court, never mind actual criminal proceedings of one kind or another, misdemeanor, felonies, or otherwise, never mind the so-called traffic courts, never mind the so-called drug courts, never mind any of the other shit, just family law. And this was considered a tamer day. And it, was felt, it, felt, it felt like I just walked, I, I felt like Dante Oligari was right there with me. Like, it was that bad. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, that, that's, that's how, yeah, I, that's how I recall my, my political, um, or I guess my uh, political field trip to a you know, what, public court hearing or whatever. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, how I put it in the article was just running, running, like how many, how many slaves can you run through the gauntlet in an hour? Um, was kind of the, <laughs> <laughs> like, that was like the, it's, it's like Jesus Christ. Like you're talking about people's freedom and it's, they got like three or four minutes, dude. Like Jesus Christ. Like this is like, we're, yeah, it's, it's in and out. Yeah, done. 
Yeah, they, they, have, they, have, they have to optimize their efficiency, right? Much like the factories, much like certain mega corporations that shall remain unnamed for now and so forth. you got, you got to optimize and you have to be super efficient and all that. They're trying to do the same thing, even though they're a monopoly and all that. Much like Gustav de Molinari said and others. But yeah, I don't know. I, I just, like, look, I, I, sorry, as a bit of a side note, speaking about political field trips, maybe with the, 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 the spiritual church people that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, maybe I need to take them out on a political field trip. Because I'm saying, because I've been trying to say, what would be a good way to finally break them of performance? And I think that's what I need to do. Let's show them the, viol- the, the violence of the state firsthand, like going to a, yeah, going to a public, even, I did that after as an anarchist, but it was certainly demonstrative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's what I'll do is I'll just kind of recommend we're going to, everybody, we're going on a political field trip to pick a thing. Doesn't matter what it is. We'll just pick something. Hell, if we're, if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll have them do a circuit. So we'll do three, like I described in the article. And maybe that will finally, finally break the back. Because I know that technique works. We've, we've had it replicated by some of our listeners and others. By the way, thank you guys who did that. Took it seriously, by the way, over the years. Uh, maybe I'll do that with these uh, spiritual, not, you know, non-religious uh, church people. I, I think I'll, I'm going to do that because this whole vote for the Democrat Party because Trump is evil and the whole, uh, unfortunately, they are involved with trying to rip down a Confederate statue. But it's kind of like, you know, we, we need to stop. You guys need to stop that. You've got other things going Like I said earlier, you've got other things going on. Let them be more mutual aid stuff. Stop the political crusading. Let's do more direct action. And I think part of stopping political crusading is the political field trips. I think I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say that publicly here now. I'm going to see... So, wait, what's today's date? We're like, what, May something? June or, excuse 2nd. me, June 2nd, right? Yep, June 2nd. It's June 2nd, 2024, at the time of this recording. Let's see how long it takes me, just as a time trial, for me to break the back of just a small local little group of, of, of well-meaning people uh, to see how, how long fast it takes can you to black, break them. How fast board. can you blackpill your fellowship is the real question you're getting at. Yes, exactly, and use the political field trips to do it. I, I think I think that would be a fun challenge, and I think I'm ready to accept that because look, I'm trying to help them. They're mostly along the good track, but we need to break that because look, here's the other problem. And this dovetails with the political prisoner side. I don't want these folks that I'm trying to have something resembling friendships with. I don't want them to become political prisoners themselves. So that's sorry. This is a circle going full circle for this episode anyway. I don't want them becoming. This political entire episode is a full circle. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Huh? This entire episode is you a full circle. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't I don't I don't want them no. So yeah, if I can use political field trips to do it, I think I'll try to see how long it takes me to do it. And look, at the end of the day, either I'm gonna be successful or I'm not. But I think I'm gonna try. Because we need we need less humans going inside the cages. Uh, we don't need more people in government dungeons, we need less of that. A lot less of that. And then I think there's, uh, I'm not going to say publicly here, but I think there's more appropriate punishments for actual criminals, actual participants in the red market. Hell, leave it the pink market while we're at it, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, another. Libertyunderattack.com forward slash assassination politics, I think would be the short link for that. Amen to that. Amen to that, brother. Absolutely. And that's just one set of methods. Uh, but yes, I think there's more appropriate methods to deal with the red and pink markets because that's something else too. Again, to go back to the five, uh, theory of the five markets for a second. I mentioned earlier about white, uh, gray, and and black, especially in the context of the of the currency thing, right? Uh, and money and so forth. But in the context of political prisoners, I mean, there are people in the red market who maybe should be in a government dungeon, but also maybe should be, you know, to use the zoomer term, not exactly walking around anymore. Well, how do they yeah, phrase it? Exactly. Six things? feet under. So, yeah. yeah. So fix the weather's good, uh, pushing daisies and all that. And maybe perhaps some people in the pink market, too, to be perfectly honest, because they're absolute scumbags and they're making all of our lives collectively as a human race. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know, sir, for the, and by the way, for the individualists in the audience, please don't. I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking literally here. That collectively, us as a human race, uh, we need less of politicians and bureaucrats, warmongers and so forth. Uh, basically dictating how we run our lives, whether it be a technocracy or some other form. Uh, we don't need more laws. We don't need more administrative regulations from the so-called fourth branch of government. We don't need any more of that. That stuff needs to stop and preferably be abolished. Like yesterday would have been the mm-hmm. best time. Tomorrow is the next best time. Yep. <laughs> That's where yep. I'm coming at it from. 
And, and to be clear for all the stupid lawyers who may be listening to this later or juries. I don't no, think we have I'm many loyal always, listeners. I don't think we have many loyal listeners. No, um, I don't think so. Well, but, 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 well, but, well, in case this gets brought up later for some well, please, reason. Yeah, please no, go ahead. This, no, I'm not calling at this time anyway. Excuse me. Let me be precise. At this time, I am not calling for any so-called violent revolution, even though to do so would be in the courts of Brandenburg v. Ohio. It's, it's just that, you know, at some point, if, if things are going to break, and when they break, people go bad, it's going to be kind of like almost like a French Revolution situation, unless you have certain things set up ahead of time. You have good, strong communities with their own independent support system, kind of like the British colonists did, kind of like how a lot of Southerners did during the war between the states and so forth. So... Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we need to grow the second realm. We need to grow the Agora. We need to have alternatives to the first realm and all that kind of stuff. Because when the violence inevitably breaks out, because status are going to do what status do, because they're all violent, then we need to have uh, proper countermeasures and proper responses. And by the way, the cops even talk like that, too, when they're dealing with their people that they deal with. Proper responses proper countermeasures and so forth. And so for us, it would be having proper countermeasures to the red market. And actually, let's go ahead and say the pink market both, because they're all like violent, crazy, mentally ill people because they believe the state is God. And I'm sorry, but verbal de-escalation will only get you so far. It can buy you time. It can avoid a lot of violence. That's true. I've had that happen to me in the field and all that in a good way, where you talk yourself out of a violent counter. But you know what? It doesn't solve everything. You know, officer presence does not solve all violent or potentially violent encounters. Verbal de-escalation and verbal commands does not solve all problems. Sometimes you actually have to have a use of force and use, you know, empty hand hard, uh, empty hand, what we call empty hand soft control or empty hand hard control to stop violent pricks and, and all that. And yes, the non-aggression principle very much applies here. Non-aggression principle is very much in line with uh, the use of force continuum and vice versa. Actually, for, that's a, a topic for another time, but all I'm simply saying is that we need to have less political prisoners. And the good thing about the political prisoners archive is that it proves that people were being violently oppressed by the state. And so yeah. moving forward, other than the documented history of what we got, I think in some ways what's more important, at least in a more immediate sense, is is really kind of limiting the, the supply of potential future political prisoners to the state. And whether that takes the counter-economic methods of, say, having a system of ad hoc safe houses or underground railroads or possibly paper tripping people and some other things that maybe I shouldn't talk about publicly, but I'll just leave it there for now. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, five flight theory would definitely apply here, especially if you're going to expatriate somebody. Uh, but then, of course, the state would, of course, lie like hell. And even if you did everything legally, uh, they would lie like hell and say, oh, you're aiding and abetting a fugitive or something. Um, and it's like, you know, that's nice. But then prove they're a fugitive first kind of thing, right? You can't just ex post facto declare somebody a fugitive allegedly and then say, oh, so, uh, you know, uh, John Q. Public was aiding and abetting. Like, right. aiding and abetting means that you actually knew mens rea would have to apply. You actually have to prove at the time that you actually knew that, uh, you know, Sam Smith was actually a wanted fugitive. And by the way, the cops like to play games with this kind of shit, but then they stop playing this kind of shit when they encounter actual fugitive recovery agents, dudes that work for bail bondsmen, because those guys, everything has to be precise. Like, okay, you know, do you have the arrest warrant on you, on your physical person, the capiate, in order to properly execute an arrest? Because remember, and this is very important, in the, state of, in the state of Texas, there's only three types of people allowed to execute, and this is relevant to the political prisoners thing, by the way. There's only three types of people that are allowed to actually affect uh, a capia. It has to be a peace officer, cop, a bludge, private investigator, or commissioned security officer. Three guesses which one I am, at least right now. And hopefully at some point I'll be two out of three of those. Point being is that if you're not one of those three things, legally speaking, you are committing a felony. A state jail, it's called a state jail felony. So when the cops like to play little games with who's a fugitive and who's not a fugitive, or they just arbitrarily label someone a fugitive, even though they're not actually a fugitive and there is no arrest warrant out on it, technically that's like falls in the area of at least slander and libel and defamation, by the way. When they lie like hell like that. 
and they also falsely accuse other people of aiding and abetting somebody who's a fugitive who's actually not. Because they're trying to turn somebody arbitrarily into a political prisoner. Anyway, I hope that all makes sense. Um, so yeah, whatever we can do to kind of make sure that people stay as safe as, as reasonably possible, uh, to make sure they stay out of the government cages, uh, is definitely a good thing. And yes, the Political Prisoners Archive is also a testimony to what happens when we don't do that. By the way, yeah, when, when you work. when you when you practice really bad. So, um, and I, I mentioned this in the you know when I brought up the Political Prisoners Archive before. Like obviously our audience now, like, we're, and I don't uh, fall into the constitutional patriot sort of ideology or whatever. But a lot of those folks that are on the Political Prisoners Archive came from that background, um, and they didn't actually um, appreciate security culture at all. Um, any stretch of the imagination or any sense of the sense of the word. Um, and, uh, yeah, even if you take some precautions, um, but then again, once, once I, once I, I don't know, um, once I, I didn't do any of the work myself, but it's like if someone, if, if and just hypothetically speaking, it would not be hard to make the connection. Um, I don't think, like, I, I'm not sure if, um, like from Twitter accounts, just Twitter specifically. Um, it wouldn't have been hard to, you know, find out who the founders of Samurai Wallet were, you know, the pseudonymous founders. Um, and I don't think right. they hit it. They don't think they hit it, hit it that much. Um, I don't think they hit it that much because because they, they didn't. They were not doing anything. They had lawyers on retainer. They had all that stuff. They they didn't. They weren't doing anything illegal. Um, and SW is on six months ago and basically said like unless they radically change the definition, um, at this point in time, where everything we're doing is a hundred percent legal and above board. So we're obviously prepared for that, that, you know, that inevitability where they change the definitions. Um, and the other part of this, T-Dev is 65. He is one of those hardcore cypherpunks. Like, this dude's probably ready to die in prison. Um, like, a month before they got arrested, um, you know, there was some release, and he <clears throat> he tweeted, it's like, thank God, I thought, all, like, thank God shit's heating up. I thought this was all for nothing. Um, so th- I guess that's the good thing about with, with SW and, and T-Dev is, like, this is... Um, <clears throat> They were they were prepared for this. Um, it was you know it, it, something that was probably f- gonna end up in the in the chain of possibilities. Um, and obviously it's not good and it's 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 upsetting and obviously you know um, all of that. Um, the good thing is though um, that uh, SW is not in um, a government dungeon. He's on house arrest, but he's at his home uh, in Pennsylvania. So they didn't actually you know I don't know. I would have thought you know following the trend of Ross Holbrook that they might have like held him in like fucking isolation for like a week or a month or something just to break him down. Um, so the fact that he was able to get out is just like, it's, that's a fucking blessing in itself. Even if he ends up going to, to prison for 25 years and hopefully God, you know, you know, creator willing, that does not happen. Um, <clears throat> but even then up until trial, he's, he's at his house with his wife and family. So like what else, like that's fucking, that's a major, again, people keeping people out of cages, like, even temporarily. Um, that was the big thing. Um, when I talked to, to diverters, like, I don't know what's going to happen with this trial, but SW is not in a cage. Like that's, that's fucking huge. It really is. Um, yeah, it is. And, and I guess one thing I want to kind of start to close out on is, and I would encourage the listeners to consider this as one way of conceiving of things of, shall we say a mental attitude is to draw some loose parallel we need to start acting like the French Maquis during World War II. We need to start acting like the German resistance in 1930s Germany. We need to start acting like some of the syndicalists in Spain to some degree. We need to start acting like uh, the Zapatistas in Chiapas. I'm not saying, like I said earlier, I'm not saying get out a firearm and start laying them out. I'm not saying that. But I am saying all that kind of preparatory stuff and being cautious and kind of, you know, looking out for your six and all that, absolutely. Anybody would be a fool or just simply ignorant if they think that this is a openly free country in the sense where you can just kind of do mildly reckless things and get away with it. Um, look, guys, this isn't just about DWI checkpoints or, D, or DUI checkpoints anymore. Uh, say what you will about those things or similar things or drug testing or whatever else. Um, the fact of the matter is that any sort of, like I said a moment, a little bit ago, any notion you have of, civil, of so-called civil liberties needs to be thrown out the window. The state has no interest whatsoever in even merely recognizing your natural liberties, much less respecting them as if it were a hill to die on. Okay, let's get that straight first and foremost. 
They do not care about your free speech. Your privacy is expressed in different ways. Uh, the sanctity of your home, um, uh, not torturing you, cruel and unusual punishment, um, all the stuff in, the, in any Bill of Rights, in any Constitution, um, they have zero inclination to respect any of that. And the only times when they do is when they need, uh, when they are, are attempting to save face for some reason. So sometimes they will give the appearance, for instance, of sometimes abiding by some provisions of due process like respecting a habeas corpus or uh, you, know, you are confronting your accusers or, or any of the other kind of legal protections to some degree. Sometimes, yeah, but it's all arbitrary and capricious anyway, which ones they respect in this moment relative to the next moment. Again, go back, go back to 1984, or 1984. Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia. Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia until next goddamn week which you're told that your Oceania is at war with East Asia, and Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Because the trick is that the clue in the second phrase is that there's actually been a change. For anybody who has a brain to put together and realize that there's been a change, but they don't want to acknowledge the change. And so same thing here. Um, it doesn't matter which alleged administration is in, in, allegedly in power. It does not matter whether there is a so-called deep state, which is really just a new moniker for really the administrative agency. It doesn't matter if there's a deep state or not. It does not matter whether the, shall we say, wherever you live, the city cops are better than the county sheriff's deputies versus the state highway patrol versus some random federal agent. Like, at some point, a bludge is a bludge is a bludge at mm -hmm. the end of the day, man. Sometimes they hate each other. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it changes on a fucking whim based on uh, mutual interest. Like, with, when it comes to civil asset forfeiture... Sometimes they will put aside their bickering and work together genuinely because they want to steal someone else's property. Yeah. It's happened over and over again, especially here in Texas. So what I'm trying to say is alternate support systems of any kind, whether food-related, energy-related, money-related, weapon-related, anything-related, uh, that needed all to be done like yesterday. Um, and again, here's the thing. This is not a doomer or a prepper or even survivalist statement. This is a common sense, like, how you want to live the rest of your life statement. And, yeah, some of this is going to involve some rearranging of your personal affairs to some degree. I mean, maybe some of you should get a last will and testament together, for instance, in case the worst happens to you, because a lot of people apparently get cancer and die from it. And what the hell is causing that? I mean, that itself is a separate topic. But you see what I mean. It's like, yeah, it's if one thing topic. isn't going to die, get you... Huh? So, yeah, it's a separate topic. Yeah, go ahead. Right, but, but it's also like, if it ain't one goddamn thing, it's another. All right. So all I'm saying is, just take precautions. Take precautions, try to live your life as best you can. And obviously, with these episodes, we're trying to kind of help move that along and experimenting yeah. with some things and trying some other things out. And, you know, maybe some things work out, maybe some don't. But at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to push the cause for human liberty forward to the degree that we can in a very practical and real sense. And it's not going to be perfect most of the time. There's going to be no. mistakes that happen. Hell, it was the I admitted earlier about my own, you know, life falling apart. Um, but is that the same as becoming a political prisoner? No. Although some, although a lot of the guys who actually became political prisoners lost their families too. <laughs> as yeah. I suspect, and got divorced. <laughs> so that that is kind of something else to consider too. So before you go out protesting, for those of you who are still reformists. Before you go out protesting, whatever else, just, just ask yourself this question: Is this worth sacrificing my family over? And that's also, too, for the guys who believe in, uh, shall we say, uh, you know, there's the notion of the three boxes or the five boxes or whatever, and there's the ammo box. Mm. For the guys that really are serious about the ammo box, same question. Is it worth sacrificing my family over? Because even if you're not going to sacrifice your family, it's also kind of the question of your way of life. Because once you pick up a weapon and you start using it against your enemies, even if you're successful in the battlefield, um, your way of life is over. True. So this whole yeah. notion of like you go to your nine to five job and you pay your taxes and, and whatever else that is gone. The second you pick up a sword, a gun, or other weapon and you use it, your way of even if you're successful, let's say you're a Che Guevara type and you win, that's best case scenario. Still, your way of life that you knew it previously is gone. So all we're saying is just like you know, make your choices accordingly. And obviously, we'll do what we can to focus more on, like, hearth and home and, and growing the agora and all that. But, yeah, um, yeah. 
just just understand that if you decide to go do some risky shit and you become a political prisoner, well, I'm not saying you deserve it, but you know maybe you didn't have the most common of senses. Let's put it that way. <laughs> sure. sure. So so I want I wanted to mention um, in regards to the, the I guess the judicial transparency aspect of this. Um, so I guess that what comes to my mind that the biggest political prisoners archiving um, venture I ever went down was the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom, where there was like too many to keep track of. Um, I think I kept track of sixteen, and there were like twenty five. Um, don't, yeah, don't get me worried about those guys. No, no, we, yeah. we don't need to. No, don't need to get into the specifics there. Um, but <laughs> in regards to judicial transparency, um, so apparently the Jack Ryan guy on Twitter that was that was feeding me documents might have been one of the defendants. I made that connection very recently. Might have been why he had access to the documents. Um, but um, you know, going back to like acquiring the documents back in that in those days, it was literally um, you know, thank thank God for Gary Hunt back, especially back in those days. Um, but yeah. the yeah, you know, you know, documents there that Jack, that Jack could provide, and again, like like providing, you know, Kyle mentioned Pacer before, um, and how they you know they try to keep these these documents locked up. It's not illegal to share core documents; these are public. I mean, they just make them hard to get. So, um, if you can find, um, like, especially, and this is something I'm still kind of kind of looking for, just because the really terrific solution, Kyle, which I want to talk about just in just a moment, um, doesn't always update very quickly. But I would like to have an inside horse. Um, if possible, uh, makes things very much easier and quicker. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, like that, that's, so it was, it was basically Charles Dyer's case and also the Malier case where it was like, Jesus Christ, like, how do you find out about what's going on in court? Especially for like, even, even for, um, you know, major, major cases like the Malier standoff. Um, like how do you acquire these court documents? Um, well, thankfully, um, Aaron Schwartz, you know, was not in vain. Um, there's a website called Court Listener now, courtlistener.com. And just like Recap, um, the idea is a plug-in. And if you're an attorney or something and you've got to buy a document for a case, if you buy it um, when you're logged into to Recap, um, you know, the opposite of Pacer, um, it makes it publicly available. So Court Listener is an actual website now. And basically within – so once they get the um, – again, like you've got to wait a week or two. This is what's, what's still what's kind of shitty about it. An inside horse would be better. Um, but, um, yeah, you, if someone buys the paste, buys the document, you can download the PDF right on the website. Um, all the court minutes are there, um, hundred percent, but the P to download the actual court documents, you got, you might have to wait like a week or two, um, which isn't that big of a deal for, for long lasting cases like this. But, um, that's, that's the, that's the big benefit here, Kyle, is that, um, or the, I guess the, the big positive is that your transparency is a lot easier and it is thanks to, in part, Aaron Swartz. Um, or in large, I mean, large part Aaron Swartz. Like, I'm not gonna under, undermine that at all. Like, um, yeah, may he rest in peace. Like, the, like that's this this solution that um, I don't nec- I don't need an inside horse now. Again, like, I don't need it, but um, it's courtlistener.com. Um, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll drop the link in the description. Um, you can go to liber- uh, libertyattack.com forward slash sw uh, if you'd rather just go to my site, or you can go to courtlistener and you'll get the exact same stuff. Um, I might have it a few days earlier if someone sends me a document, but there's no difference, essentially. So judicial transparency, Kyle, um, long and short of it is um, it's kind of solved. And <laughs> it is thankfully, you know, thankfully due to Taryn Schwartz um, and, and recap. Um, recap was not useful before. It was not useful because it had to basically be something like a document that you're looking for there that was already on there. But um, court listener does. I mean, this is this is great. Um, it's a major, major step up in judicial transparency. Um, and it's yeah, open source, all that. So I guess that's the that's the really great thing to end out on. Um, not that we're necessarily completely done yet, but that's the the huge thing for judicial transparency is that it's not even a battle anymore. Well, the good thing too about it too is that for people that are willing to study whatever court cases, whatever documents, it's that court court case too. It's also if they have a brain. It also serves as kind of an illustrative example of stuff not to do, right? Because if, let's say, John, uh, John Doe defendant got picked up by the blood because he was fucking drunk and high and driving, I don't know, an ATV at, like, rush hour traffic and, like... Something retarded. Like, yeah. Somebody off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then, then I mean, I'm being facetious, but you see what I mean, though, right? Um, now, even for stuff that you would think would be somewhat more fly under the radar, but maybe somebody got caught for some other reason. 
uh, maybe they overlooked something. Maybe they made a uh, tactical error, strategic error even. Um, then that would be also be useful to learn too what exactly the 20 million different details are regarding how somebody got picked up, even if they were yeah. being careful. So yeah, that's that, that's, that, yeah, that's, 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 that's huge. Yes. And it's, um, these digital transparency, like even just learning, like the, because I mean, it's the when with bludgies, um, you know, they don't hire people with too high of an IQ. They want to be good order followers. You know, that's the that's what's come out, and I, I think it's I think it's probably true. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, the majority of the are trying to make it to retirement, they're collecting the pensions, like I said yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, again, the long and the short of it is. It's a series of the, the judicial transparency is valuable as a series of case studies for what not to do, and that it also kind of gives us an insight as to how the blood jobs operate too, in, in terms of how they think. So, unless you have a first realm job like I do, where you're dealing with the blood pretty much at least once a week, if not every day, then another way of also, and that way you kind of just to experience, kind of understand how how cops work. Um, and again, we're not talking about right and wrong here. We're talking about like, oh, they look at people's hands all the time. Well, here's the big fucking joke. I look at people's hands all the time now too. Um, but the other value about the judicial transparency is now you see it kind of from the judiciary side about how they look at people. So yeah, when to, to piggyback on something you said earlier, uh, when the lawyers start making stupid analogies about like eggs and, and who's got possession, that whole thing, that kind of shows you where they're coming from. Uh, whether that be due to mental illness or not, um, as long, it, it kind of gives you a window into the mind of the enemy. Let's put it that exactly. way. Does that make sense? Ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, what comes to mind for me right now is we're talking about political field trips earlier, and more and more aspects of the political field trips. Um, you know, obviously the in-person thing is is obviously preferable. Um, you know, real-world emotions and you know, real-world settings is is obviously preferable. But um, in terms of security culture, you could do quite a few of these things um, probably remotely. Um, in terms of just just finding out, um, you know, going back to you know, like the, it's 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 all the same procedure whether you're in Minnesota or New Mexico or fucking New York. Um, all of the fucking cops do the exact same fucking thing. They're trained by the same people. Um, like it, it's all the exact same shit. So um, as, as you're saying, with um, um, you know, like a, a judicial transparency gives you an eye, an, an eye into the judiciary. Um, what I've been looking into as of late, and it's it's fucking great because it's like they're they're, it's mindless drones. Um, there's no critical thinking. It's it's like uh, like like you were saying earlier that um a, a a huge felony might be committed in front of them, and they just like, nope, that's okay. Um, like for whatever whatever reason or whatever program, whatever whatever, 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 whatever the hell it is, whatever the hell it is, probably the paperwork. That's probably the paperwork thing is that if they were to arrest them for a felony, they'd have a lot of paperwork. That's probably the excuse, um, or that's probably the reasoning. One of them, but um, another one is they just don't want to deal with them because they've actually dealt with these same repeat offenders before. That probably, came up with, yeah. on a different occasion as well. Just, again, when I say again, guys, I can't make this shit up. When the cops have told me, the blood have told me in person when I'm at work. That uh, at least in previous jobs, not the current one. Um, but yeah, they just let these guys just run loose. Like, it's it's actually quite terrifying in a lot of ways because people actually have to live in those ghetto areas and even some non-ghetto areas. So there's a reason why, like in the Greater Austin area, people have either migrated north or south, generally speaking, to try and get away as best as they can. And you know what? I know some stupid leftist types will make. Stupid arguments based on prejudice where they're arguing about so-called white flight. Well, here's the big fucking joke. People of color also do white flight because they, too, have family and they, too, have businesses that they don't want broken into again and again and again because they have the same concerns as actually the rest of everyone else who isn't a so-called person of color. So when the lefties, most of whom are Caucasian anyway, are making racial arguments, about so-called white flight, well, white flight isn't limited to Caucasian people. People of color also do white flight because nobody wants to be around the violent felons that the cops just let loose, just run around. So, like, it, 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 it's almost like the political types, the political crusaders of whatever stripe, it, it, it's like they're mentally ill. I'm sorry, I keep going back to that, and I'm not saying it's an excuse for their behavior at all, but I am saying the sheer irrationality of it 
especially when they come across people like us and they even think about what we're saying for a second and then they just go in fucking circles and all that. It's like, wow, you're not even comprehending what I'm saying, much less. And even in the case where they do disagree. You get that you like, get you get the fluoride stare. I know what that looks like. Yeah, oh, <laughs> the fl- the fluoride oh, fluoride stare. stare, yeah. Yeah. So basically to kind of start to close out here a little bit. Um Basically, what I'm trying to do, kind of in my own practice of both Vanu and Agorism, and both, is I'm basically I'm giving these particular kind of spiritual but not religious group of people who shall remain unnamed for now. I'm trying to give them a chance because they're kind of they're not quite there. They're like mostly direct action, but they kind of want to go in that direction. So, to 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 borrow a phrase from a certain Christopher Nolan character, uh, or shall I say DC Comics character? Oh God, we're going back uh, to comic books. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Um, give you, know, <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's something kind of rolling along. I'm just there to give it a little push. And so, yeah, I'm just going to go and get, go give it a little push and see if it turns out all right. And you know, whether that takes the form of a political field trip or something else, but I think I'll try a political field trip first. Then all, you know, all's well better. I mean, dude, like I said earlier, they already have a wicked drum circle. Okay. I think we've left the conventional organized religious whatever that is actually itself also very status with their tax exempt status bullshit. Sorry, yeah. I did have to say that for the for the leftists I do get along with still. Yeah, we're getting away from the organized religious tax exempt bullshit. Um, which itself is very status for its own uh merits, kinda of like how corporate taxes work and or even just taxes in general, right? Uh the graduated income tax and this tax and the sales tax and every tax that existed in addition to the national debt and whatever level of inflation is going on this week and so forth. Um you know, I you know, we don't wanna we don't wanna have more people become political prisoners. We want to keep the political prisoner generating mill go to zero is the ideal. Um and and of course, you know, local currencies, alternative currencies, think the commodities that can be used as money, thanks for other that forms back, yeah. of money. Yep. That's yeah. where I was going to close I mean, out. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Sorry. Go ahead. No. 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 Like. No. I. I no. I'm. 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 I. Hundred percent on board. Um. What. Whether we're talking about what we started with or ending with on traditional transparency, um. It's all the same thing. Um. It really is. Um. And it seems like the the solution to me and the the, the problem with any of these things is why like mutualism or socialism. Not like like I used to have a knee jerk like Misesian reaction to that sort of you know thing. Um, but we're talking about, we're talking about fucking scale here, right? We're talking about scale. Um, and on like a homestead or like, uh, one of the, uh, if you go to IC.org and you look at one of these central communities that's been in California since like 1974 or some shit like that, they just stay off the radar and they do what they do. Um, and they have their small, um, they've got their, you know, their, um, it's open to the point, you know, people can come stay there for a short term to learn about the homes, you know, to learn about their intentional community and, and that sort of stuff. But they're pretty much closed off to the outside world. Um, yeah. And okay. I think I that, mean, I think that's, so. that, that's sort of that, like that, that sort of a decentralized model um, is, is, is the future. And um, I guess the, the hard part of it is what we're talking about tonight is um, facilitating payments across um you know, disparate second realms, whether they may be in um, right. Veritas an hour, an hour and a half east of St. Louis or in fucking, I don't know, Europe. Um, like, like th- those are really the, like the, it's the local stuff is the local stuff is, is, is actually relatively easy. Um, like we can have, we can have like a lot of the local stuff, like on Pasnia. If you think about like, think of them as like intentional communities or mutual aid enclaves or whatever, um, a lot of the te- that technological stuff locally is super easy. The problem, the the hard part becomes when you go across the internet and those less privacy friendly places. Um, so yeah, like I, I think we're all, we're all on the same. And uh, me and you are especially on the same page. But I think everyone's on the same page here that, um, and, and and even in terms of payments, like you could ha- like uh, um, yeah, you like obviously you could use like Bitcoin on Lightning, which I'd probably say would be better for like a, a mutual for a, a local community. But at that point, you don't need fucking Bitcoin um, if you're building locally. Um, barter is like the best thing, um, as as what we found out. Like, forget trading, you know, trading currency, even if it's silver, or copper, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Like, if uh, you know, bartering. Um, you want to harvest some. You want to harvest some stuff on the homestead. You want to, um, you know, lay out some some cloth, like whatever. Like it doesn't matter. Like that's more valuable to us than currency anyway. 
Um, and I think that's, um, for, 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 for a lot of places on the, on the PASNA, PASNA map and directory, that's, you know, that's obviously, you know, first and paramount is, there's just always, there's endless work to do at all times, but, um, <clears throat> but yeah, beyond that, um, yeah, there, there, there are definitely other, other ways, um, other ways to, to exchange value. And really like, I think that's, that's really the, um, yeah, Bitcoin and Samurai is great. Um, but at this point, um, if you're, if you need something to use in the day to day, like, um, yeah, barter, um, things like that are just, are, are great. Um, bartering services, um, specialties, whatever. Um, we don't have to get into a medium exchange. Um, like those things are far more, or, or in a lot of, in a lot of areas, far more valuable. And the fact that there's actually no currency exchange, even if it's, you know, Bitcoin and Samurai two months ago, um, coin joins you know bitcoin from samurai like if you don't have to interact with a network at all and it can just be like human to human that's always preferable always 100 percent preferable right. so um last thing no, I, I, last, yeah last go thing. for it brother yeah go for it last, last, thing, last thing i'll say for this episode before you close it out for good if everyone took care of their own backyards and did it seriously in more than one sense if everybody took care of their own backyards the state would have already been abolished by now so Therefore, arguably as a meta goal, if you will, the best way to avoid violence, real physical violence in the form of war, in the form of crime, in the form of pick a thing, the best way to avoid violence is to take care of your own backyard. Bingo. Because really when violence breaks out, that is really evidence of a lot of things, but one thing is evidence of is that somebody failed in taking care of their own backyard. So I don't, I don't want to go to the whole diatribe about yard care because I'm not li talking literally about a yard. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 but, 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 but like in terms of like the classical like Vonowitz literature about Vonowitz, or excuse me, or about our Vanuans and Vonowitz mini cultures, everyone takes care of their own backyard. And does, seriously, there is no government. There is no state. There's no need for one. Also, everyone recognizes how evil it is anyway. And that would be the end of that. We'd have other ways of resolving disputes or whatever else. And that would be the end of the state, finally. It's not the only threat to human liberty, but it's definitely the most dangerous one in our lifetimes and for, for the foreseeable future. So again, if everyone took care of their own backyard, the state would have already been abolished by now. And the best yep. way to avoid violence is to take care of your own backyard. Yep. Or I, I guess the, the way um, my posthumous mentor, um, Bill Cooper, put it back in 1990, I don't know, five or six when I was a mere three or four years old, um, he put it, um, basically in the sense, you know, looking in the mirror, um, if you want to know what's, and he used constitutional terms, if you want to know the pro, if you want to know what's wrong with America, look in the mirror. Um, and that's like, uh, that's, that's always been the most, uh, the most attractive thing to me. Like, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's the problem lies with, you know, the problem lies with the individual, um, lies with, um, and we're talking, you know, you know, government and state existing. Yeah. If people internalize that responsibility, um, for their day-to-day -day lives in all aspects, um, then yeah, the state would not be necessary. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, it's, it's, you know, harking back to Bill Cooper, you know, look, looking in the fucking mirror and, and, and what, um, you know, what are you doing? Because you are, you are one of many, um, you know, one of many humans in this world. And if everyone, you know, looked as, and, and, and that, yeah, if everyone looked, looked at it that intensively or even had the opportunity to, um, which I think 2020 actually did for for quite a few folks when they got out to nature and things, um, when they didn't have to go to you know go to their servile society jobs, um, it made them rethink a lot. Um, I think it did for you, and it's, it did it did for me at that time too. Um, so um, yeah. Anyway, rambling aside, rambling aside. Um, yeah, like another another good episode, brother. Um, I think we we've, we've we've covered basically we we yeah, we've covered everything. Um, yeah, we do have some episodes. We do have some episode topics that are currently in the works. I still need, and I will say this publicly, I still need to finish the outline for the private security series, which I have delayed on too long. My apologies. I'm adding even more stuff to it, and I still need to send you a draft of that. So my apologies on that. But I do want to say that publicly, I have not forgotten about it. I have not. I have been delaying on it. Yes, but there's been also some other developments and all that. And yes, I will try to get that to you as soon as possible. Hopefully this week. Um, but yeah, um, I'm also, I'm, and you know what, I might be trying to take on too much, but I've also been trying to get my own personal life working and all that, which I'm hopefully on the tail end of now, 
Uh, actually, hold on. I do want to say this very, 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 very last thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next step in the whole divorce mess is um, a friend of mine actually helped me uh, draft a document basically responding to the actual divorce papers. And so I'm going to try and get that notarized and then filed with, uh, I think it's Williamson County Court, uh, and basically try to get that moved along so we can get whatever needs to be settled, settled to where the divorce is not contested. And so the sooner she is out of my life for real this time, uh, even in a legal legal sense, uh, she's out because, again, she wanted the separation, she wanted the divorce, and all I'm doing right now is basically more, it's more due diligence at this point. So, I mean, I've already gone through the grief. In some ways, still am. I've already gone through the grief. You know, the future that we could we could have had and were trying to have is now gone permanently uh, because she wanted it. Um, and then that's that. So, and she decided to bring the state into our bedroom and our lives and our home and all that. So, um, at this point, I'm doing due diligence, just trying to kind of move the divorce thing along. And so, get the document notarized, get it filed with the court, and then hopefully this can be settled sooner rather than later. And uh, and by the way, as a side note, I'm not in favor of the whole so-called divorce party thing. Divorces are not a happy thing. Even if it's mm. a good result or for whatever reason, it's still nothing to celebrate. People still okay? Um, divorces, I mean, it would be kind of like, I don't want to compare divorces to funerals. Taking them the form of wanna... might be more appropriate. You don't want to compare divorces to funerals, and it cut out for 10 seconds. And I feel like that was an important point. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'll, repeat. I'll repeat it. It's fine. Am I coming through okay now? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, so I don't want to compare divorces to funerals necessarily, um, but like a wake, depending on the nature of the deceased, a wake could take the form of a party if that's like what the deceased want or be in accordance with their personality or... It was other, or if it was otherwise appropriate for some reason. Uh, but a divorce, generally speaking, I'm having a real hard time in any divorce, even where it was, a, shall we say, a good divorce or a necessary one. Like, like let's say it was the result of like a domestic violence thing or something, right? Um, where the divorce really was the right way to go. Um, even then, what's there to celebrate? I mean, again, there's a reason why you celebrate birthdays. There's a reason why you celebrate weddings, right? Uh, divorces and uh, divorces uh, again. The funeral thing's kind of an iffy one, at least in my mind. But divorces like are never are never something to get excited about. I mean, there's definitely. Re- I mean, depending on the circumstances, there can be relief when you get divorced. Sure, depending on whatever those circumstances are, especially if it was something really serious like a domestic violence or something. But along those lines, where it's of a criminal nature. But otherwise, you know, a divorce is a type of death that is chosen. Right? I mean, death is death. So unless it's a suicide, it's not chosen. Divorce is chosen. So there's like an added layer of awfulness of some kind of Lovecraftian horror kind of to it, where, again, it's humans were Cthulhu, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and that itself is kind of its own whole separate topic. But, but suffice it to say, everybody, you've got some other episodes in the works. I need to get my act together, at least regarding with the private security series. And, yeah, there's some other things, too, that uh, I do want to talk to you about privately. Uh, maybe not necessarily today, but, but soon. Uh, that are that are relevant to the practice of Vondo and agorism and, and, uh, and such related things. But, yeah, seriously, um, you know, folks, get your backyards in order. That's how you help free the world, ultimately. Yep. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, yeah, it certainly does. And I will mention... Um, some, I don't promote much. I mean, I don't really do that many um, behind my AI, my trusty AI host. Um, sometimes there's a lot of episodes for me. Um, but I don't do a lot of episodes anymore. Um, but I, I, sh- I should mention the Midwest Space Liberty Fest, MPL, MPLFest.org. I don't remember the, the dates of the event, but go to MPLFest.org and you'll, you'll, you'll get it. And, and we'll be there. Oregon, I'll be there. Um, or, we're, we're a little less excited about it this year. Um, but um, at the same time... Um, yeah, we'll we'll be we'll, we'll be there, and if you want to get vetted to come to Pasnia, um, to come to Veritas, that is 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 the best way to do it. Um, you know, getting together in physical space and time, and 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 you know, all that all that stuff. Um, that's 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 definitely most important. And then what I will mention more pertinently to you to you, Kyle, is, um, Bonnie Fest, Bonnie Fest Five. I think it's five. Bonnie Fest Five uh, happening September thirtieth to October seventh. Um, of course, this is a um, um, a vetted event, not open to the public. 
but um, it's not super hard to get vetted, especially if you've been around and, and you've got a reputation. It's not hard to get vetted um, non-physically. But I think hopefully Kyle will be there. Um, and there might be some other folks there too, which again, I, I, I want to disclose, but I have not gotten confirmation yet. And even if I have gotten confirmation, I still don't want to just disclose it, um, at least right now. So things can change. Um, as I could with you, Kyle. You might not be able to make it. Um, September 30th, October 7th, or whenever you're able to. But um, I'd certainly hope you are, and and there will definitely be folks, um, long-time listeners of the podcast, who would love to meet you. Um, so I guess there is that, too. Well, right now, I will say this publicly. I am trying to move heaven and earth to save whatever money I can to get whatever PTO I need to get so I can make it. Um, I'm not going to make any promises right now, but I'm going to make every conceivable effort to. And, of course, once we get closer, I can either firm up either way. But, no, that's, hey, now that uh, I'm no longer, uh, you know, happily married man, um, I can have a social life now. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely on my list of things to do for sure. Right on, brother. Right on. Um, yeah, lots of folks that would, would, would love to, to meet you out here. Um, apparently, And again, anyone out here is already vetted. So anyone that you meet here would, would be someone you want to meet. Um, and yeah, that's trusted security culture. Because again, to, to, to harken back to, to all that, I mean, all that you, you've, I mean, passing was, was basically founded off of um, security, security culture principles we talked about, um, you know, long back in the day. So um yeah you're a foundation of this place even though you haven't been here and you should be here at some point to, to experience um this second realm because there are many of them um but this is this is definitely one of many um and i do hope you and anyone else will come out if they're you know if they want to um send me an email coordinator at paznia.com uh coordinator at paznia.com or dm on on any platform um that is suited to you that i'm on there's too many to list um and uh yeah we want we want people here but we just got to do it in, in this manner um actually i actually invited um sw out for it wasn't vani fest but it it was it might have been the um uh, labor day weekend which i don't remember what freedom holiday that was that was going to be but i was trying to come up with a bitcoin privacy event and it's yeah unfortunately yeah it's not going to pan out um but yeah, there's other folks. Um, can't talk about it publicly. I wish I, I so wish I could, but I will not talk about it publicly until it's, until there's something available for me to promote. Um, and also in the manner that it needs to be done. But um, anyway, enough rambling aside. Um, Kyle, anything else before I let you come in? Before I uh, officially close it out. No, no. Everybody, take care of your own backyard and. Uh... Yeah, that's about it for now. Yep. Take care of your backyards and look in the mirror. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty much the, the long and the short of it. Um, the inner is the outer. And talk about a whole lot of hermetic principles, which I don't know, maybe Colin and I, Colin's not familiar with, but we do that later on. Um, anyway, folks, uh, passing.com for anything the free republic. Uh, if you want uh, want to learn more about what we're doing here, uh, if you learn about all the various passing departments, uh, passing mineral department, uh, um, passing Bitcoin department, passing health, uh, passing department of health and wellness, um, anything like that, you can learn what we're. I mean, the second realm is a replacement of the first realm, um, and it, these are all necessary human institutions. But the the problem is the foundation. Um, so we're building these these things upon a foundation of truth, um, a foundation of peace, and a foundation of voluntarism. So. Um, yeah, passing.com, you can, you can look into specifics and obviously subject to change as, as my knowledge and, and, uh, and such changes. But, um, yeah, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, you can learn a lot of Pasnia and learn how to get involved. Uh, if you've got a homestead, if you've got, uh, um, local health food stores, uh, local farms, um, whatever that you think would be valuable to Venuans, to self-liberators, passing.com forward slash join, uh, is the form to fill out there. Um, obviously self-sufficient homesteads are, are great, but, um, again, with any submit, anything that could be added to the map that could be a value to self-liberators, um, is, is a value. Um, the other thing is passing.com forward slash join two. Uh, if you're a nomad, uh, or, you know, otherwise self-liberator looking for access in the network, but not looking to, um, provide anything like that. Um, that's also important too. Um, it's also important. So check that out, fill out that form. Um, and, uh, Finally, VaniPodcast.com for all things Vanu. Um, 
and libertyattack.com if you want to acquire the books um, or privacy tools or whatever to help you on your path to self-liberation. Um, all of that is available. Um, thanks so much, Kyle, for being here. Thanks so much for all of you guys for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. And until next time, cheers, guys. Vonya Life 2025, Resurrected Introduction, back in March 1973, Rayo and many of the most hardcore self-liberators of the time, and likely even today, published a massive 75,000-word issue of Vonya Life, that is shockingly relevant and of immense value, even today. And while that was a highlight, there was also an entire zine series of Vonya Life, which I recently digitized. As Rayo finished up those last words of transcribing, it was with a heavy heart dot until the idea hit him like a collapsing roof of a badly engineered underground shelter. Vonya life should most certainly be resurrected, just as the overall freedom strategy of Vonya has in the modern day and age. And if you know anything about Vonya life, you know some of the greatest content came from contributors. That's where you come in. Let's dive into the plan. The plan, Von Your Life, March 1973, was the only issue released in that year. Similarly, we should aim for one book a year, the first being Von Your Life 2025. That will give ample time to acquire and create content, and to have plenty to report on as far as developments, or setbacks, of our liberated lifestyles. Content Section 1, Situations and Searches Lifestyle Reports from Self-Liberators, a report about your liberated lifestyle, things you've learned, your goals, what led you to venuism slash self-liberation, etc. Reviews of books, equipment, organizations, tips and tricks, etc. Information that you feel is valuable to pass on, that's not in article form. Section 2, General Strategy Back in Von Life's heyday, topics sought out included, Van Nomadism, Pedestrian Nomadism, Wilderness Von you, international travel, family and children, intentional communities, new country projects, financial independence, health liberation, venue in cities, and underground shelters and troglodytism, we still want articles on any and all of those topics, but additional ones include, private communications, sovereign networking, venueing in cities in the 2020s, alternative housing solutions, etc. If you're curious about your topic in particular, just ask. Examples of both will be posted at vonupodcast.com slash the year 2025. Timeframes Any submissions must be made by July 1st, 2025. After a few months of editing and preparing, we will aim for a fall 2025 release. Notes this is not a general, send us an article submission to fill space. It has to be of the caliber that Vonulife deserves and was founded upon, Hardcore solutions slash hardcore action, no political crusading and no collective movementism, the principle of voluntarism, that all interactions should be voluntary, must be maintained. I.e., don't siphon, steal, gas to fund your van nomadism. General proofreading slash editing will be done on every article, maintaining each author's individual voice, but as always, editorial designs have to be made. Email submissions, questions, ideas to shane at libertyunderattack.com.